All right. And everybody can see the screen. Yes. It says 21 days of well set riches. New. Okay. Great. So, real quick, um, and if you guys want to respond in the chat box, that'd be great. Uh, first of all, again, uh, those of you who are still interested in signing up for the apprentice class, uh, we have a couple seats left. Please go to Life Changing Education. If you want to get one of the scholarships or have uh, special payment plan needs, uh, what you want to do is go ahead and sign up under the existing payment plan and then reach out to Lisa at Need Help Ask Lisa. Need Help Ask Lisa.com and she'll take care of you. Okay. Um, those who did turn in buyer broker agreements, I'll be meeting with you on Wednesday at five o'clock. Expect to get an email from me confirming that time and arrangements. It'll be online, of course, no reason to jump in a car, just be available and accessible uh, by your computer, your iPhone, your iPad, your Droid, whatever. And again, just a quick reminder, uh, today is the review session. So today really is the last day. So if you have not done so, I really would appreciate it if you would go ahead and put in an evaluation. Again, the link is in the Facebook group, um, but I really would appreciate it if you would go ahead and take care of that. Um, those of you who, a uh, quick reminder, those of you who are interested in signing up for gold membership, a couple people asked me, the link is Real Investors Gold. Real Investors Gold, it is normally $297 a month, but we will honor uh, the $197, so the $100 off. And again, those of you who are already members and anybody who signs up for membership at the gold level, uh, your membership will never increase. Your membership dues, excuse me, will never increase. Um, and what that gets you is, of course, um, access to the uh, 21 days course um, in perpetuity, uh, the new one, as well as the old one, uh, three weekly live coaching mentoring sessions, uh, one masterclass every month, and that's a live masterclass that's done on, drilled down on a very specific topic like putting together a seven figure fires list. Um, how do we, you know, we talked a little bit during this class about 10X wholesaling secrets. We dive deep on how to actually do that. Talk about how to wholesale commercial deals uh, like Marissa did in her case study yesterday. So all the kinds of things you guys have been asking me about, but we just didn't have time during the 21 days. Those are the kinds of things we go through and, and dig deep into during the course of the year. And you can always uh, ask me a topic and you can always recommend a session um, if it's not on the calendar, you don't see it and like, gee, I really want to hear Sherman talk about this or bring in a guest speaker to talk about that. Um, you guys can also recommend and we'll, we'll get the right people uh, at the right place in time to go through that masterclass. Um, and again, the most important thing is once you become a member at Real Investors, uh, you will never have an increase in your dues. Um, now, if you quit and come back, that's a different story. <laughs> uh, but as long as, as long as you're a dues paying member, you will never see an increase. And as I said yesterday, we looked, uh, we got, we got together for a staff meeting last week and realized we had not raised our dues prices in 10 years. And we like, that's crazy. So um, we will be increasing the dues pretty soon for any new members, but you guys can still get in at the uh, 2020 rate. We did have a, a, a bump in dues in December of 2020 to the new rate. Um, and then we're gonna bump it again so that we can get a little bit closer to where it should be. Where we really should be quite honestly is about $500 a month. If you really compare what we do, what we give, what we make available to our members versus any other program out there, it really is in the, in the 500 to thousand dollar month range. I don't know if we'll ever get to a thousand, but we are gonna get closer to 500 over the next coming uh, years. Um, but for right now, um, it, whatever dues you're paying now, if you are a gold member or above, that will not increase. And if you join uh, as a gold plus member or gold member, excuse me, uh, it'll be 197 if you do that um, this weekend. Okay. Next up, or today, sorry, today and yesterday. Um, I need to stop saying weekend. I think about life changing weekend that we used to do. Okay. Um, we also talk about the apprentice program and how for many of you guys, that really ought to be the next step. And again, I've already said, if you want to sign up for the apprentice program, uh, you can go to Life Changing Weekend. Uh, and again, Lisa will take care of you if you need any, have any special payment needs. Lisa takes care of the money. Sherman does not. So don't ask me about money. All right. So here's where we are. Hard to believe. We have gone through, oh my goodness, all three of our modules. Um, we have um, now coming down to the home stretch. This is our last live session together for this class. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. Have you enjoyed it? Give me a thumbs up if this has been good for you. Um, I've enjoyed it. It's been a lot of work. I won't, I won't lie about that. <laughs> but I have enjoyed it. I really, really have. 
So just a quick recap. Uh, here's your quiz for today. Um, everybody remember what this is, what this represents? If you remember what this is, please put it in the chat box. Tell me what that is. Uh, my good friend David Bach wrote a whole book about it called The Automatic Millionaire. What is that? What is that? Exactly. This is a, a graphic representation of an amortizing loan and an amortizing mortgage. And once you understand the power of the amortizing mortgage, you understand the power of real estate and how real estate has the power to make you filthy, stinking rich. It literally is a forced savings program where somebody else is contributing to your savings, uh, AKA your tenant. Um, in fact, doggone it, I'm gonna have to add one more slide when we get towards the end because I totally forgot I took some pictures yesterday um, and I need to make sure I throw that into the end of the lesson. So wherever we are today, please do not let me forget to throw in the picture that I took yesterday when I was driving around. So somebody's gonna remind me of that, okay? But yes, once we understand the amortizing mortgage, the amortizing mortgage, we, we start to fully understand and embrace the power of real estate to make us rich, okay? Uh, and if this is sort of a new concept, please go back to the first two days, the first week, and review that lesson. Next up, the currency of real estate is, please type in the chat box, bingo, deals. If you wanna be taken seriously in this business, if you want people to return your phone calls, if you want people to get to know you and you wanna to get to know other people, start getting good at either finding or putting together deals. The deals don't have to be yours. Um, that's the very essence and the very definition of a bird dog. Bird dog is somebody who puts a buyer and a seller together. So. The deals don't have to be deals that you put together. Not, not everybody, quite frankly, is cut out to be a deal maker. Now, having said that, everybody should at least make a, make a valiant attempt at becoming a deal maker. But if you've been at this for a while and come to the deal maker workshops that are available to our members and you're feeling like, gee, maybe the deal making thing's not for me, that's okay. Hang out with deal makers and help them market their deals. Um, there's a lot of value in helping deal makers market deals. So the currency of real estate is deals. If you want to be taken seriously, if you want people to return your phone calls, if you want to be in the game, the name of the game is deals, okay? Next up, um, some people say there are a thousand and one ways to make money in real estate. How many ways are there really to make money in real estate? Please type that in the chat box. Please type that in the chat box. Bingo, there's really only 13. There's really only 13 different ways. And these are the ones that we, that we talked about, investing in others, land development, notes and paper. Funny thing, I was having a conversation with my wife today. Um, she's in the process of negotiating on a deal that uh, Gregory found. Gregory's my oldest son. And it happened to have two lots. Uh, so it's a house that needs to be refurbished and two lots. And so she's asking me, how do you value a lot? How do you make money, for, uh, uh, how do you make money off a lot? Should I go ahead and build houses on it? We were having that whole conversation today. I probably should have whipped out the recorder and recorded it, but I don't think she would appreciate it. Uh, but uh, the bottom line is land development is probably one of the most lucrative things you can ever do, but it's not the place to start. Um, notes and papers can be extremely lucrative. Ask, ask uh, Terry Humphreys, the tax lien queen. Um, buy and hold, contract for deed, subject to, le sale lease packs. I'm sorry, tax liens, lease option, rehabbing, foreclosure, and of course, lease options and sale lease pack and subject to are all nothing down techniques. And these are great strategies, but they're not the place to start. Of all these 13 strategies, where should a new investor focus their attention? What two strategies should a new investor focus their attention on? Please put that in the chat box. Please put that in the chat box. Bingo, wholesaling and bird dogging. Wholesaling and bird dogging. And of the two, wholesaling is preferred because with wholesaling, you're actually putting a property under contract and assigning your contract. If it's a border realtor contract, we take the additional step of setting up an LLC and the LLC enters into the contract and then we sell our position in the LLC. But the bottom line is you have more control and you make bigger profits, much bigger profits when you are a wholesaler versus being a bird dog. And think about it this way. Real estate agents are licensed bird dogs. And once you get going in this business, you're gonna very quickly realize that even though the real estate agent may have more experience than you, they're walking out of the settlement with a $3,000 check and you're walking out of the settlement with a $5,000 check. And the reason why your check is 5,000 is because you took on a little more risk. Bird dogs take on zero risk. If you are the kind of person who is risk averse, but you want to be in the real estate business, you want to be a bird dog. But you got to check with your local laws to see whether or not you can be a bird dog without having a license, okay? But my recommendation is don't be a bird dog 
know enough about it to teach other people how to be bird dogs and let them bird dog for you. And you stick to being a wholesaler because your profit checks are substantially greater. In MLS deals, water realtor deals, the 80% of the marketplace that realtors control, average profits are about $5,000 a deal. But I've seen 7,500, I've seen 10,000, I've seen 15,000 from board of realtor deals. You get outside the board of realtors and start going up to the FISBOs. And by the way, do we, do, we leap into, do we leap into FISBOs or phase two? How do, we, how, do we get into, how do we get into FISBOs or phase two? That's right, we pivot. You guys are good. You guys are real good. So when you pivot into doing wholesaling phase two deals, you'll find that your checks are gonna go up astronomically. The average, the average profit that I've been seeing for the past several years for phase two FISBO deals is about $20,000 a deal. So that's you know four times what you're gonna make off an MLS deal. And I understand why a lot of people wanna immediately leap into phase two, but those who leap into phase two without going through phase one very quickly find themselves back at phase one because they don't have any of the network, any of the team or any of the skills to be successful going after wholesale deals in phase two. But once you do phase one, for some period of time, like about 21 days, <laughs> then you are ready to start pivoting into phase two, all right? Next, at Real Investors, we exist to help investors go through the five phases, the five phases of growth as an investor. Can anybody tell me what the five phases of growth are as an investor? Please put it in the chat box. What are the five phases that investors go through. What are the five phases that investors go through? <laughs> what are they? Hint, 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 right? Oh, there you go. Diane's abbreviating, right? Quick cash, chunks of cash, cash flow, wealth acceleration and legacy wealth. Those are the five phases that every investor goes through. And everybody has to have some place to start. For the vast majority, it's in the quick cash phase. And I've seen people come into this business like, why do I need to do quick cash? I've got an 800 FICO score and I make $400,000 a year. Why, do I, why would everyone do quick cash? Because at some point in time, you're going to want to bring on private investors. At what phase, answer this for me, at which of these phases do you start to develop your buyers list? In which of those five phases do you develop your buyer's list? Exactly, the quick cash phase. And when you're ready to start developing a private investor list, what list do you turn to to develop private investors? Your buyer's list. Well, what happens if you skip that phase altogether and you have no buyer's list? What happens if you skip the quick cash phase and you never develop a buyer's list because you make all kinds of like, no, it's not that you won't have an exit strategy, it's that you will have to go, it's like that game shoots and ladders. You'll have to go all the way back to the beginning or rely upon somebody else. And those of you who know Steve Streetman, he'll tell you his story. He had a very good salary, still does, had a, had a very strong business, still does, had all kinds of security clearances that he can't even talk about, still does. And as a result, and he had, you know, really strong credit and very good cash and He's like, why do I ever need to be a wholesaler? And then he wound up going out doing some deals using his own money. And then he started doing commercial deals. And when he started doing commercial deals, he suddenly realized no matter how deep his pockets were, they weren't deep enough. So he needed to bring on private investors. So he hired an attorney who developed the PPM document, who developed all the legal documents he needed. And then the attorney said, now here's a deal. This is called a private placement memorandum or PPM. That means you can only get money from people that you already have a relationship with. Steve's problem was he never did the quick cash phase and therefore he never developed a buyer's list. And therefore he had no group of people to turn to, to talk about investing in his deal. So what was the solution? It wasn't bad. He went to a Barra, the wealth building CPA and said, Hey, do you have any clients who would be interested in this deal? She said, sure. But then she took hers off the top. And as a result, he did wind up getting investors in the deal. However, A, those investors were more loyal to a bear than they were to him. And that's only natural. And B, she cut, she took her cut. I won't get into how she took her cut that because that's beyond the, the scope of this class. 
But as soon as he did that, he realized, you know what, I need to go back to wholesale and just so I can build my buyer's list so I can then start the process of building my private investor list, okay? If you skip a phase, you're gonna have to go all the way back down to the bottom of the ladder and start all over again. So you might as well pick it up from the beginning. And Steve will be the first person to tell you that, okay? All right, so um, real investors, we exist to help you through each one of these phases. We have five core classes that match up with each one of these phases. The first class that we recommend people take is the apprentice class. The next one that we re recommend people take is the physical marketing class that gets you the chunks attached. The next class that we recommend is the where to get the money class because you kind of need that before you jump into rehabbing. That starts to set you up for cash flow. And then the next class is the rehabbing class because the rehabbing class gets you into the game in terms of buy, buy fix, flip and buy, fix, hold. Okay, and it's the combination of those four classes, apprentice, FISBO, where to get the money, and rehabbing that builds your foundation. When people ask me, well, which of these classes I should take, I normally say take all four of them and take all four of them as you're building your business your first year to set yourself up for what comes next, which is wealth acceleration. Wealth acceleration is a combination of having a business in place, which means you are doing the thing and creating a look over my shoulder program so you can start to cultivate relationships to start building your private investor list, okay? And then of course, after you get that under your belt, then and only then do we recommend that you take the six month commercial property class and that's when your wealth really explodes. And along the way, we also have uh, in REIU, which is uh, our members online learning uh, portal, we also have a full four day training on asset protection, along with a certificate to go meet with an asset protection attorney to help you start setting up your legacy wealth plan. In other words, your estate, your estate plan, okay? So real investors, we have classes, we have events, we have courses, and it's all in that course catalog that I gave you guys the first week. You guys remember getting that catalog the first week and I said, just hang on to it, okay? As you progress as a real investor, start looking at that catalog and saying, hmm, strategically, strategically thinking, strategically speaking, what's the next class I should be looking at, okay? So look, again, everything you need to be successful in this business, I've already given it to you. Everything you need to be successful, I've already given it to you. A roadmap, a plan, a plan for getting started, a plan for your first year, a plan for building your look over the shoulder program, everything you need, I've given it to you in this 21 days. Now, if you wanna continue on in the relationship, and have me help you understand, I'm gonna help you implement what you already have. If, if you wanna just take what you got, implement it, and you don't need my help, that's fine. And, but everything you need, you already have in your possession. On the other hand, if you say, hey, you know, I kinda wanna stick around and wanna take the next class, I wanna earn my real investor designation. And oh, by the way, I, I failed to mention it, um, but in the catalog, it also talks about earning the uh, CP RIA designation. So several of you folks who have been in the program for the past 21 days are real estate agents. And you've asked me off and on, how do I get the CP RIA designation? It's in the book. It's in, it's in that catalog, that course catalog I gave you back during week number one. Um, and so there's two pages on the CP RIA designation. Um, so, okay, so a couple people said they did not get that. I will send that out again today. Okay, so I owe you guys one more piece of information, which is uh, there's an optional survey that I would love for you guys to take. It'll be a survey monkey link. And in that survey monkey link, uh, when you click it, it'll be like a 10 question survey. I'm still playing around with it. It just asks you about the class and the ways we can improve the class. And I will make sure that I attach the course catalog along with that, okay? So everybody will get a second copy of the course catalog along with the link to the uh, survey monkey um survey and that'll probably go out tomorrow okay all right oh uh, where are we okay so next up mayo mayo what is the mayo formula what does mayo stand for please put that in the chat box please put that in the chat box maximum allowable offer that's right maximum allowable offer. And the Mayo formula looks like this. We take the fair market after repair value, otherwise known as comps. We multiply that by a loan to value, which is what we get from a hard money lender. 
and then we subtract out our repair costs. So and, and it looks something like this. Mayo equals whatever the comps are times 0.75 minus repair costs. So if the, if the um, fair market value is 185,000 for that neighborhood, um, then 0.75 times 185 is 138.750. And then uh, fic uh, fictitiously, we just said 50,000 repair costs. So your Mayo offer for this house on that day is 88,750. Everybody see how that works? Everybody see how that works? Give me a thumbs up if you see how that works, all right? And again, you guys should have worked with this enough that this is no great mystery anymore, okay? Maybe it was at the beginning, but it shouldn't be now. Uh, will I be sending out contracts without the watermark? Absolutely not. <laughs> Can anybody tell me why Sherman will not be sending out contracts without a watermark in this class? Or for that matter, any other class? Exactly, because they are for educational purposes only. The only time I can ever give you a contract that is a contract you can use is either A, I'm acting as your attorney, which will never happen because Sherman will never take the bar. And even though Sherman got an A plus in his contracts class when he went to law school, I made a decision very long time ago that I would not sit for the bar. I would not become an attorney. I would want to hurt myself if I became an attorney um, for all kinds of reasons. But the, most re but the most important reason why is because you can make so much more money as, an, as a real estate investor than you can as, can as an attorney billing out by the hour. Billing out by the hour is not the way to go. But I did want to get the knowledge. And quite frankly, I had um, read and studied that a lot of very wealthy people who made money in real estate um, often had a legal background, folks like Sam Zell. So like Sam Zell and his business partner, Peter Lorre, met at uh, University of Michigan in law school together. And they started buying apartment buildings while they were in law school. And by the time they finished law school, uh, three years later, they never ever actually practiced law because they'd made so much money and they were making so much money that they didn't have to practice law. So they did form their own law firm, but the, basically all they did was real estate deals. Um, and they used their own law firm to basically do the legal work. Um, but those guys became billionaires. In fact, Sam Zell became billionaire three times over um, in three separate parts of real estate. He's got a, he has a company called uh, Equity equity apartments that owns apartments. He's got a company called equity something. It's not equity trust. That's a totally different company, but equity office, equity office. And then he also had a company that did uh, mobile homes and mobile home parks. Each one of them, each one of those companies was made him a billionaire individually. Uh, and so um, Sam Zell is one of the folks I oftentimes point to as a guy who went to law school, but never act, ever practiced law a day in his life because he just basically took the knowledge. It, it, do you have to go to law school? No. Do you have to have a real estate license? No. But as you get in this business and really enjoy this business, there are some things that can assist you, um, like taking a law school class, like listening to Sherman when he talks about how important the Constitution is, blah, 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 blah. So the only two times I can ever give you a contract to actually use are if A, I, I were to become a lawyer, which isn't going to happen, or B, if you engage me as your broker, and I assign you to one of the diamond members and, they be, and you have a diamond member coach and we start using the board of realtor contracts. And I will obviously instruct you on how to use the board of realtor contracts. In fact, I've done that in class, but the ones I gave you in class say educational purposes only because I was acting not in my capacity as a broker, I was acting in my capacity as a teacher. And in my capacity as a teacher, I can explain what these things are, but I cannot tell you specifically how to use it on a specific deal, not as a teacher. Now, as your broker, absolutely. So if you would like for me to give you contracts that do not have watermarks, sign the buyer broker agreement, enter into a fiduciary relationship with me, and I'll be your broker, and I'll be more than happy to give you all the contracts you want or need, or whatever jurisdiction you want or need where I am licensed, which is Maryland, DC, Virginia, and Pennsylvania through reciprocity, okay? All right, next up, can somebody tell me what this is? <laughs> Red, yellow, fill in the blank. Red, yellow, what would be the third? Green, right. The red, yellow, green light strategy. If we only have one exit strategy, it's a red light. If we have two exit strategies, it's a yellow light. And if we have three exit strategies, it's a green light. Everybody understand that? Ideally, we would like to put offers out in the street get the best and final, be ready to tie up a piece of property and have three exit strategies, but that's rarely the case. Almost always you either have one or two. 
then you have to work with your diamond coach to strategize on how you can potentially get one more. There are opportunities to turn a red light deal into a yellow light deal. And there are oftentimes uh, opportunities to turn a yellow light deal into a green light deal. But rarely when you go make an offer on a property is it immediately a green light. You may have to renegotiate the price. You may have to renegotiate the terms. You may have to renegotiate the settlement. You may need to buy a little more extra time so that you can find the right uh, um, end user buyer to wholesale it to because maybe there's some end user buyers who are active in that neighborhood. Um, but more often than not, you're going to wind up having a bunch of yellow light deals or red light deals, and you're going to have to figure out a way to strategize with your negotiator, your uh, diamond um, coach, to turn them into yellow or green light. Okay, and then uh, why seven five versus seven? Can somebody tell Donald why this number might change? Why might that number change in your Mayo formula? Anybody want, anybody want to share? Exactly. Depends on what the hard money lender says. This, this number is a variable that's dictated by the hard money lender. If you're working with a hard money lender that's telling you it's 0.75, use 0.75. If you're working with a hard money lender that says it's 0.6, and that seems to be what the going rate is, it's 0.6. That, this variable changes based on market conditions, okay? All righty. Coming down to the home stretch. So, three rules of automation. You guys seeing that on your screen? Three rules of automation. Give me a thumbs up. Yes. Okay. Rule number one never automate a process that, please type in the chat box. Never automate a process that does not work. Exactly. Never automate a process that does not work. So, make sure it's working before you automate it. Automation is not fill in the blank. Automation is not software. Automation is systems, but a system doesn't necessarily mean software. Automation is technology, but technology doesn't necessarily mean software. Again, never forget, Henry Ford changed the world through automation and never purchased a single piece of software. But what did Henry Ford do? He changed the way automobiles were built by, by developing a conveyor belt. Nobody had ever developed a conveyor belt where the car moves along and the different workers work on different parts. That was technology, and that very much was a system, but it wasn't software. And that's, what, and that's the point I'm trying to make. So many new investors get all hung up on which piece of software should I buy to automate my business? That's the wrong question. And if you ever find yourself asking yourself that question or anybody else, slap yourself. Because you'd be like, I totally forgot what Sherman said. Automation is not software. Automation is systems. Automation is technology, but it's thinking through, hey, how do I have a system? How do I make this better so that I am doing what, folks? Fill in the sentence. I'm keeping 90% of the profits while doing X percent of the work, 10%. How is it even possible? It's possible when I get somebody else or somebody's else to do 90% of the work for what percent of the profit? 10%. That can only happen if you have a system. That can only happen if you use technology. If I decided after I've gotten my phase one up and running to go to realvirtualassistant.com and hire a virtual assistant, I'm using technology to hire somebody half a world away with a 13 hour difference in time to do the same kind of work that I'm doing and I would probably find somebody locally to do for $30 an hour or $20 an hour, and I'm finding somebody half a world away at 10 bucks an hour. It is the technology of voice over IP that makes that possible, that I could actually find an English speaking person who's got multiple master's degrees and is willing to work for only $10 an hour. It's technology that makes that possible. And together we will put together a system. Well, Sherman, where do we get the system? I already gave it to you. <laughs> and anybody who asked me tonight, where do I get this? Where do I get this? Where do I get? I already gave it to you. Everything you need, including the tools to automate your business. How do we automate our business? By having checklists and cheat sheets and metrics. By the way, what exactly is a board of realtor contract? What's a board of realtor contract? And why is Sherman making us fill out a hundred of these? What is that? What is that? 
At the end of the day, what's a border realty contract in the context of automating? It's a cheat sheet. Well, how in the world is that a cheat sheet? Well, for every deal you'll ever do that's handled by a realtor, you use the same contract over and over again. Well, if you use the same contract over and over again, can't you delegate that to somebody else to do? But if every deal required its own contract, its own conversation with the lawyer, its own $5,000 fee to draft a very project specific contract, that's not a cheat sheet. You're starting from scratch every single time. But by focusing on the board of realtor deals first, and the board of realtors having the same contract they use over and over and over and over and over and over again. Now, yes, granted, they may change one or two paragraphs every year, but after you know what that new paragraph is and get that new contract, you're good for a year. Does anybody other than me understand how powerful that is in terms of automation and keeping your costs down? The board of realtor contract is a cheat sheet. Now it's an 11 page cheat sheet. Okay, granted, but it's a cheat sheet. It's, it's a way to do something that you can automate because you don't have to do it. You don't have to recreate it over and over and over and over and over and over again. Your, your property checklist that you take when you go meet with your contract, that's a cheat sheet. And some of you are like, well, what's a cheat sheet? I've given you guys cheat sheets. The contract's a cheat sheet. You know what else is a cheat sheet? Your daily activity log. That's a cheat sheet. If you get up every day and you're like, gee, what am I going to do today? I don't know. I'm at least, let's spend an hour talking about what we're going to do today and no ability to sort of strategize, think through, or process. Then every day is like a new day. And I guess that's okay. I mean, if you, if you kind of like living your life that way, I guess that's okay. But sometimes it's okay to have a little bit of order. <laughs> sometimes it's okay to say, okay, what do I need to do today, tomorrow, da 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 da, the whole week? Oh, look, there's like three or four times. I'm dealing with this one task. Rather than having three or four times during the week, I'm dealing with one task. Why don't I just time block? Why don't I just say, you know what? Why don't I just deal with that on Wednesdays at two o'clock? And from two to four, I've blocked out time to deal with that. So I don't have to during the rest of the week. I came to that revelation 20 years ago. It's called staff meeting. Anytime anybody asks me anything about the business of real investors, I only deal with it on staff meeting day from two to four. You guys have seen that. When you guys come see me, talk to me, catch me, we're not talking about real investors, the business stuff. You may be asking me about your homework. If you're a VIP or platinum coaching member and you're in that uh, special relationship with me that you have my phone number and you have, and you have the ability to text me and I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you about your stuff. And anything that comes up about, well, what about my bill? And I couldn't get this piece of software. What answer do you always get from me? What is the answer that always comes out of Sherman's mouth? What is it? Please type in the chat box. Nope, nope, nope. You guys gotta be more specific than that. Needhelpasklisa.com. <laughs> it's not just ask Lisa, because if I were to do that to Lisa, she would kill me. And on top of which, what kind of instruction is that to you? Go ask Lisa. Well, go ask Lisa how? Call her, get in my car and drive there? No, every time you guys ask me anything about the business of real investors or a software or a situation or a bill, my answer is always the same. Needhelpasklisa.com. Why is it that I do that? Any of you guys ever think, you know, why does he do that? You know, why can't Sherman just answer my question? Why can't Sherman just drop everything he's doing right now and get on that computer and get me an answer? Why can't Sherman call Lisa right now? I don't care what. Because it's horribly inefficient. You guys say to me, I don't have enough time to do these lessons. You say to me, Sherman, I want to have time and freedom. You say to me, Sherman, I want to, I want to, I've seen your videos. I've seen your Facebook page. I want to live a life like you. Well, if you want to live like a life like me, then why not follow the things I advise you, strongly advise you to do? Start with the process of looking at how you're spending your time and then figure out, okay, what things am I doing during the middle of the week and how do I sort of organize them together? And then, oh, by the way, once I organize them together, is there somebody else who can deal with this 
better than I can. And after you've done this for a few months, a year, a couple of years, you suddenly realize, oh my gosh, I have bought back not just hours, but days in my calendar. Because for every time I'm not dealing with it, somebody else is dealing with it, that's time I've stolen back from the time monsters. You understand know there's people who want to basically steal your time from you? Now think about this for a second. Really think about this. How long does it take for the words need help asklisa.com to come out of my mouth? Quick, somebody time me. Somebody get a watch. Get a watch. Let me know when you're ready. Somebody watch. Somebody say go. Shiva, say go. Need help asklisa.com. What was that? Two seconds? Five seconds. Okay. All right. Five seconds. All right. Five seconds. Now, what if on the other hand you say, well, Sherman, I don't have my week three catalog and I need my week three booklet. And I say, need help at Lisa.com. You know, well, Sherman, can't you call Lisa? Okay, let me see if I can get Lisa on the phone. Now, how long will that take? Okay, Lisa, I handed out a week three book and so and, and so and so didn't get it. Yeah, that one. No, no, this one, no, that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can we go on the computer? Let's go on the computer, the three of us together, and see if we can find out what happened to it. Do you guys understand how that completely steals my time? Well, no, nah, Sherman, I don't get it. Some of you do. I'll just leave it at that. Some of y'all just had an aha moment, by the way. <laughs> some, of y'all, some of you guys had an aha moment, and some of you guys are like, when is Sherman going to teach me how to get rich? I'll leave it at that. Because if I do any more, I'm going to be meddling. All right. So back to the slides. I better get back on the slides. I'm going to be in trouble. Um, test, measure, test. Have metrics, have cheat sheets, have checklists. Have processes, have systems. And don't be afraid to use and leverage technology. Like how many of you guys enjoyed what I shared with you yesterday about building your website in three minutes or less? Anybody enjoy? Okay. We're leveraging technology. We're leveraging Facebook and all the Facebook spins to sort of make Facebook easy and simple and all the money that they spend to keep that thing up and running and keep the Russian trolls from, from hacking it to death, right? We're, 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 we're using the technology of phone.com and, or, or ringcentral.com. We're using the technology of whatever uh, company we use to go get our website or domain name, excuse me, and then the ability to point that domain name anywhere we want. We're using technology. We're just not becoming a slave to technology. We're not getting all wrapped around the axle saying, okay, well, now I got to go to some seminar just to figure out how to build a website. This is all about doing things in the most efficient manner possible, which 99.9% of the time means keeping it simple, Sherman. Please put that in the chat box. Keep it simple, Sherman. Simplicity is your friend. I'd rather Mark Zuckerberg spend hundreds of millions of hundreds of millions of dollars in research and development to create Facebook and keep Facebook up and running and keep Facebook simple. So that I can just come along and say, oh, why don't I just hack Facebook to do what I need to do in terms of getting a website up? Keeping it simple. All right. Now, last couple slides. So after we do what we've learned in the 21 day course, that 14 step process that I went over uh, I think it was on day 19, we pivot. So we get that wholesaling machine up and running, put it on autopilot, and then we pivot to some of those other strategies. Which other strategies? I don't know. You pick. Whichever one you want. You can do foreclosure consultant, you can skip foreclosure consultant. You can do rehabbing, you can skip rehabbing. You can do lease options, you can say, doesn't matter. Your choice, dealer's choice but you got to get that first part out of the way, that quick cash machine. We got to get that quick cash machine built up and running and on autopilot before we take on any one of those other um, 11 strategies, okay? And then finally, we talked about pivoting to what's next. We saw an example of how Dave and Neil, our investors of the year, pivoted from wholesaling into rehabbing, mainly to rehab and resell so they can come up with some chunks of cash. But eventually, they're going to be the, at the point that where they want to be, which is buying houses, rehabbing houses, and keeping them to hold so that they can, in fact, have cash flow. Because that's what truly makes you wealthy. 
having somebody else get up at oh dark 30 and spend their whole day at a job just to pay your mortgage and make you rich. And then of course we got into the light of Oprah talking about uh, the life lessons from studying one billionaire and how Oprah became a billionaire through syndication and how developing a look over my shoulder program or LOS is the secret to us becoming wealthy um, at a minimum generating $200,000 a year. Um, and we talked about the first step in that process is we must do what? What's the first step in the process? What's the first step in the process? What's the first thing we got to do? Please put in the chat box. What is it? What is it? That's right, do the thing. And y'all you know, be like, Sherman, what's do the thing? Doing the thing means picking any one of those 13 different ways of making money and getting good at it. Get, and what's the benchmark for getting good at it? Making 100 grand a year. Get, get good enough to at least make 100 grand a year. And that might even be part time basis because once you get there, you can legitimately start doing the next step, right? So step one, do the thing. Step two, create a look over my shoulder program, which if you are doing the thing is the easiest thing in the world to do because you're already doing it. If you're already doing the thing, then creating a look over my shoulder program is simple and straightforward and easy. All right. Have I got that? Does that make sense to everybody? You getting this? Okay. All right. And then finally, after you do both of those things, start looking for ways to become a celebrity. And that allows you to get other people to tell your story and sing your praises. Okay. And again, um, talking about what's next after you finish the 21 day course, um, lots of people have gone on to take the apprentice program, lots of success, success stories, um, applying the 21 day course, applying the 21 day course in a manner where you're building that first six figure business. Okay. So with that, let me go ahead and stop sharing screen. And you guys tell me what you want to talk about. This is open mic. This is your opportunity to uh, have me coach, walk you through whatever you'd like for me to walk you through. This is your session. Who's got questions? Who's got questions? Anybody? You got a question, raise your hand. We can unmute you. This is open office hour, so we can unmute. What would you like to talk about? Hey, Shiva. Hey, Sherman. Yeah, um, would you mind sharing a little bit more about how to integrate Chintmail into the Facebook for marketing campaign? Or to create Mailchimp? A so you want me to, you want me to show you how to integrate Mailchimp? Yeah, um, to, with Facebook to, okay. to create the marketing campaign or call to action. Okay, so let's go to Loving Care Homes because that's sort of my demo site. And let me share a screen. All right, you guys see my screen okay? Okay, so this is my Loving Care Homes website, right? And so like one of the things that I did just as a, you know, once you get the basic, this is this is the cover photo, right? So your cover photo, and, and it's doing this because I'm in a sort of a admin mode, but um, it's got, of course, my name of my company, my my vanity phone number up here, and then lovingcarehomes.com. And then in addition to your cover photo, you also need what's called a profile photo. And notice the profile photo looks very similar to the cover photo, but the profile photo is designed for the profile. And so the phone number and the name are right in the middle. Whereas in the cover, the name's in the middle, but the phone number's up top, right? So that's this, this is what the profile photo looks like. Typically it's a square sort of like two inch by two inch. And you want to make sure that you get the most important stuff right in the middle. Obviously, the most important stuff is the phone, num is the phone number um, because that's what I want people to do. And then I just added in a couple of things just as placeholders. This was something that was um, online that I saw. And it was about this lady who was a dancer and she's actually seeing herself dance. And it's, it's sparking memories 
and it's all about how to use video and stuff to get people and then some elderly. So these are all just placeholders, right? And if I was using my website as a wholesaler, I might shoot a video, a little selfie video in front of a house and post it right here as opposed to what I did in this particular instance. Does that make sense? Okay. So when you're ready to start using MailChimp, MailChimp can actually um, create some landing pages. And I'll be the first one to say, I don't use MailChimp, I use something called Infusionsoft. But the basic concept is the same. So once you get your basic page set up, you can upload stuff to your page. You can upload photos, you can upload videos. And in Facebook, you can upload a video and then you can paste in a link. You with me? So as an example, let me, let me go to something different. Let's go to one that you may have seen. Here's 21 days to real estate riches. And here is our group, right? And notice I have, I just uploaded a photo, right? So the photo looks like this, right? And it says, are you enjoying this new 21 days to real estate riches? Please leave an honest rating of trust pile by going here now and notice what we have here. What's that? The link. So I ask you to click the link and when you go to the link, it takes you to the trust pilot page to put in your rating. Mm -hmm. You would be doing the exact same thing with, with MailChimp. Okay, so I would just tie the MailChimp chimp link to the Facebook page? Don't think of it as quote unquote tying. Think of it as you're gonna basically cut and paste the URL. Okay. If you use MailChimp, as a way to gather, a way to collect people's names for leads, mm -hmm. when you are ready to automate it, one of the one of the features that Mailchimp has is the ability to create landing pages. Okay. All right. Let me give you let me give you a, another example because I'm not sure that this one's working out so good. Um, I think it's inside our group. It may not be. I may have to go someplace. Oh. Sorry. Sit. Sorry. That's not me. I don't. Oh. That's Mamie. <laughs> Mamie. Okay. He's having dog issues. <laughs> I, I know that feeling. <laughs> right now, my doggy's wearing a cone of shame because he had eye surgery. We had the eye surgery to remove the cataracts. So he's got this big old cone on his head. And every time he walks around, he bumps into everybody, knocks him down. Um, all right, so it's not here. Let me go to another page. Let me think of another page where it might be. Ah, okay, probably here. Probably here. Okay, here we go. Here's a, here's a here's a much better example. You may or may not have seen this. Okay. Um, are you seeing the page now? Yes. All right, and you're seeing a video, right? Yeah. This is a selfie video that I shot over at Howard Johnson's house. In Woodmore, I call. I literally called Howard. I said, "Hey, man, I'm getting ready to do a new 21 day program. Can I come to your house and shoot a video in your front lawn?" He's like, "What do you want me to do?" I said, "Just stand on the stoop." He said, "That's it." I said, "That's it, right?" So notice, there's neither one of us has to wear a mask because Gee, I'd love to live inside a gated community. Hey, it's Sherman Ragland, the real investor. Here's my buddy Howard Johnson. We're just having a good time. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. So I'm here at Howard's house. And so now you would probably think watching this video, oh, Sherman's just leaving Howard's house. No, that's not how it happened at all. I drove up. I called him. I said, hey, man, you got five minutes. He's like, yep. I said, okay, just meet me on the front stoop. He said, you want me to get in the car? I said, nope. Do I need to wear a Nope. Just meet me on the front stoop. And then I pulled out my iPhone and started shooting. Okay. Notice this video was what? Six minutes and 51 seconds. And in the six minute, 51 second video, I'm explaining, talking about, the upcoming opportunity to participate in the 21 days real estate riches class, which is the one that you're going through right now. Okay. So I shoot the video on my iPhone. And then after I look at it, in this case, I didn't have to edit it. I upload it to the Facebook page. And then in there, I talk about, well, here's the link. This one doesn't actually even have the link to sign up. It just talks about, but there's another one I posted where I actually put in the link, okay? And that link takes you to a quote unquote sales page to sign up 
for this event that you're going through now. In a similar manner, you can take your Facebook page and upload to your Facebook page a video. And at the end of the video, say, if you're interested in this house, please click the link below. And that link below will be to a page off of, it will not be a Facebook page, it'll be a separate page. That link that they click goes to your MailChimp account. Okay. And that's where they plug in the information. Now, to be congruent, write that word down, that's a very important word. To be congruent, I would probably take the same video, if possible, and embed it into the MailChimp page. So that th when they land at the MailChimp page, they know they've come to the right place. If MailChimp doesn't allow you to embed the video, or you choose not to embed the video, at least put in a picture that looks similar to the video. And again, if you've hung out with me long enough, which you have, you've seen me do these exact things. Have you ever gotten an email from me and there was a picture in it and the picture had a big orange play button? Yeah, I think so. Like all the time. <laughs> <laughs> At least once a month, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and by the way, why do I put the orange play button on the picture? So they'll know to hit it to play it. Because, because you, have been, you have been subliminally conditioned to click play buttons. We all have. And so you'll hit, you'll click the button embedded in the photo and there's a link embedded in the photo and it takes you to a video. Mm -hmm. And when you go to the video, doesn't the video kind of sort of look like the play button? Yep. Almost always, right? So I don't know why it's not on this one. Let me try a different page. Uh, I thought for sure I had DCR a Yeah, I thought I for sure I had actually uploaded a video that actually had the link to the sales page. Um, and that's why I wanted to show you that one. Maybe it was Nova Rio. That's so many, that's so many daggone pages. <laughs> Sometimes it's hard to track. Okay, here we go. Here's one. Here, this is a better version. And I want to interact with it. Okay, so this is cool. So are you looking at this one now? This is actually from uh, the Nova Rio website. Yes. Okay. And the Nova Rio website has like 5.3 million people on it. 5.3, uh, 5,300. Is that right? 5,300. Yeah. All right. So here, when I click on this one, right, and I say see more, right, this one says, hey, are you looking to get past your first deal? And then I say www.21daysrealestateriches.com. Now, the reason why I wrote it is because sometimes Facebook does not like it when you use a when you use a, a, a domain name that that refers to another domain name um because they view that um and this is a new feature they view that as sort of cloaking or camouflaging mm -hmm. so they will so if i were to actually put 21 days real estate riches dot com with the dot it would take it to a page that has a 404 error you know what a 404 error is yeah your page not found right so what i have to do is put 21 days of real estate riches and then dot in parentheses. So everybody knows what it is. And then the actual URL. So this is the actual URL. Notice what the actual URL says. HTTPS forward slash forward slash M181. What's the next word? Infusion. I can't see it. It's so small, but I see. About now? Okay. Infusion.com. Soft. Okay. So again, like I said to you, I use Infusionsoft, not SurveyMonkey. If you have to okay. do the same trick, your, I'm not sorry, sorry, MailChimp. Yours will say MailChimp and then whatever the name of the, right? So this, so this is not quote unquote embedded in the Facebook. I don't want it embedded. I want a hot link, but I don't want to embed it. What do I want embedded? I want the video embedded. I want people to, I want people to watch the video. And then if they're interested. It's simple. It can be easy. It's not always easy, but here's the bottom line. You're never going to get that apartment building. You're never going to get that portfolio of real estate. You're never going to wheel and deal like a real investor. You're never going to get your 10,000 square foot mansion until you get past your very 
first deal. And okay. that so in a similar way, you would be doing a video that you're just talking about the house. Okay. Hey investors, are you looking for a really hot deal? Just got this one under contract this morning. First come, first serve. If you want more details, click the link. See where I'm going with that? Mm -hmm. And then here's the link, and they click the link. That link takes them to a sales page in Infusionsoft. All right. So this is the sales page in Infusionsoft. No, do you notice what they see as soon as they get there? Your program. Mm -mm. Same what? video. Oh, the same. Okay. Why? Why do I want them to see the same video or at least a picture? Because it's connected or related to what they just saw. It is congruent. Yeah, congruent. Yes. Congruency is everything when you're dealing with online stuff. If I show them a picture that's different than the website they just left, they know they're going to another website. They know that they're leaving Facebook going to another website. If I show them something that's different, what's what is what are people's um, first instinct? when they click something on Facebook, but then they're taken to a page that looks totally different. What's their first instinct? They're confused. They're not sure it's the same thing. Exactly. And most people just close the window because they're not sure if they just became a victim of a phishing scam. They're not, they're not sure if they've just being, if they're being taken advantage of. So it's really important that as you take them from one page to another, there's congruency. And the easiest way to be congruent is to show them the exact same video that they saw when they were in the Facebook page. Okay. Now, there's some advanced stuff you can do, and I don't really want to get into that now. I do kind of get into it in our visible marketing class, where they don't even have to leave Facebook. You don't have to give them a link to leave Facebook. You can actually integrate it into Facebook. But I don't recommend doing that up front. A, it's just more complicated. B, there's more stuff that can go wrong. C, it's not the highest and best use of your time right now. Okay. After you've been doing this for a while, if you start looking at your metrics and you're like, gee, I wonder if I embed the, if I embed the page as opposed to linking to the page, will I get better performance? All right? That's one of those testing variables that you do way down the road. But for right now, you're just simply going, okay, here's my video, explains the property, explains what I'm doing, tell them to click the link above or click the link, find the link inside and click the link. And then you click the link. And when you go here, Here's the more detailed sales page. This is what will be in MailChimp. This page here resides in Infusionsoft because Infusionsoft is my CRM. Okay. And as I explained yesterday, the reason why I use Infusionsoft and not MailChimp and never really use MailChimp is because I have employees and I have more, there's, there's more than me touching the software. If it was just me and a virtual assistant, one login, one password is fine. If something gets screwed up, I know who did it. But when I have multiple employees, including some part-time employees, I need to have different security features that to the best of my knowledge, MailChimp doesn't have. So I stepped up and went to Infusionsoft because Infusionsoft, I can have almost an unlimited number of employees touching the software and giving them different security permissions as to how they access the software and understanding if something blows up or something gets screwed up, knowing exactly who did it so I can have a conversation with them. Can't do that with MailChimp, okay? Yeah, but, now, now, quick question. This sounds very effective for finding buyers and, yep. sell, and selling uh, products. In terms of trying to find um, sellers, do you think this could be effective as well? When you get ready to start doing FISBO marketing, phase two marketing, mm -hmm. and you start doing things like flyers or yellow letters, um, you got two choices. You can do the simpler, like we talked about yesterday, just give them a phone number, mm -hmm. right? You understand this. Every time you give people another option, you also increase the possibility of doing what? Losing them. Confusing them. Okay. Which fundamentally is the same thing, right? Because the, <laughs> the confused mind always says. Uh, never. Yeah, exactly. No, right? So if I, if I, if I give you a yellow letter and the yellow letter says, hey, me and my wife are in the neighborhood. We're looking to buy houses. Um, if you have a house for sale, if your house is for sale, please call this phone number. Well, A, it's simple. B, it's congruent. Like if you really are driving around the neighborhood and you really did leave this handwritten letter, you're probably going to give me a phone number and not much else. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. 
But if I say, okay, I got a handwritten letter, I'm leaving it on all the, all the houses. My wife and I were in the neighborhood looking to buy a house in the neighborhood. We really love this neighborhood. Um, if you're interested in selling or know somebody who's interested in selling, please, please call or email or go to this I buy houses website. Are you beginning to see something here? Yeah. It's getting kind of chunky <laughs> and it's becoming less and less congruent. If you're, if you're just driving around the neighborhood looking for a house to buy, which is why you put a handwritten note in my mailbox, why do you have a We Buy Houses website that you want me to go to? Mm. Is that, is that kind of like not congruent with the story? Have you, have you had the physical marketing class? Have you gone through the physical marketing class yet? Yes. Okay, so you remember the module where we talked about yellow letters? Yes. And we talked about the original concept behind the yellow letter when, when John and, and Mary actually created, John, uh, Mary, Ron LeGrand's assistant, and John, her husband, created it, how it literally was they were out looking for houses and they forgot their flyers. And so John grabbed the yellow pad and just wrote a handwritten note on every house they went to. And it just went like this. Hi, my name is John. My wife, Mary, and I are looking to buy a house in this neighborhood. If you want to sell your house or if you know any houses for sale, please call me. That was it. And the beauty of it was the simplicity of it. There's a, there was a certain authentic, genuine nature. And what they realized um, by doing their measuring and testing was when they left that handwritten letter that one time, it way outperformed. It did way better than their We Buy Houses flyers. So they started doing yellow letters as their number one marketing campaign. But again, the simplicity of it is it's a handwritten note on a yellow piece of paper. It doesn't, and it's left behind. It doesn't come in the mail. It doesn't have a website. It doesn't have a whole lot of call my assistant. None of that stuff. And the more you kind of junk it up, the less simple it is, the more complicated it becomes, the less effective it becomes. Does that make sense? So to answer your question, if you're going to be doing phase two marketing, you want to kind of look at, well, what's, what's my strategy? You know, am I going to use yellow letters? Am I going to use bandit signs? Am I going to use direct mail, postcards? Quite frankly, everything's up in the air right now because the post office is just so messed up uh, in terms of getting even first class mail out. I mean, forget about quote unquote bulk mail or junk mail. Even first class mail is taking, you know, three, four months to be delivered. It's a mess, right? So let's say you decided to do a postcard campaign, uh, just a really simple, we buy houses, we pay top dollar, the thing that's really popular right now is sort of taking a picture of somebody's house and there's apps to do that. You take a picture of somebody's house and says, hey, I was driving by your house. I like your house. Is your house for sale? Please call the phone number in the back or, uh, or go to the website. Now, there you could do a website. If you did a website, then you can certainly use MailChimp and have MailChimp create a page just for that campaign. And so similar as what we talked about yesterday, you could create your own individual unique URL. Um, what's the name of your company and what's your domain name? Um, at your service home buyers. Okay, That's so one. at your service home buyers is, is your primary domain. It's your primary website, right? If you're only working one neighborhood and you're gonna be working that neighborhood for a while, then redirect that domain to that neighborhood. On the other hand, if it's like, we're gonna be working this neighborhood then this neighborhood and this neighborhood, you want to make you may want to have separate domain names right you may want to have um at your service capital heights right at your service lanham seabrook you know and the underlying website is the same but you change it based on the neighborhood mm -hmm. and you have more than one url what did you pay for your domain name well it was about 10 bucks and then when you add on um yeah they got you privacy or whatever yeah, they, yeah, they got <laughs> like yeah. but but if you were to, but if you were to do s separate domains for yeah. these separate marketing campaigns they're going to be between 10 and 20 bucks a pop yeah and so you could, yeah so you say to yourself is it worth it to have a, a spend another 20 dollars to have you know a website and post uh, and and all my marketing just for capital heights and and only you can answer that question but if the answer is yeah it probably would make sense it also gives you the better, a better ability to track your performance for that marketing campaign just for Capital Heights and see, you know, you're grabbing all the information on one page for Capital Heights. You're grabbing all the information on another page for Lanham Seabrook. You're grabbing all the information on another page for Hyattsville. 
And so all three pages look the same, except one actually says, we're buying houses in Hyattsville. We're buying houses in Capitol Hyatt. That's the only difference. That's the only nuanced difference. But there are three separate and distinct pages that you would set up inside of your MailChimp account where each one will tell you, okay, the lead source was the Capitol Heights page. The lead source was the Lanham Seabrook page, the Hyattsville page. And then you can look and look and see over the span of like a month, okay, where do we generate the most leads? For whatever reason, whatever we're doing in Capitol Heights is working and whatever we're doing in Lanham Seabrook is not. And you can do that, you know, do separate page for your bandit sign, separate page for yellow letters, separate, or just separate pages for different parts of town. You can organize it any way that you want. Right. Same is true for phone numbers. If you're using an account like, uh, well, even Google, I guess even Google Voice, you can get separate phone numbers. Have a separate phone number for Capital Heights campaign. Have a separate phone number for Lanham Seabrook campaign. So that people are calling totally separate numbers. And that way you can track. You know, and this is especially important. Let's say that you get to the point where you've automated phase one by turning it over to a virtual assistant, but now you're going to quote unquote automate phase two because you're going to do it. And then you're going to go hire some bird dogs and you meet with those bird dogs and say, okay, your territory is this part of Capitol Heights and your territory is this part of Lanham Seabrook and your territory is this part of Heightsville. And I will provide you with the flyers, the yellow letters, the cards, but you have to go hand them out. And every, and every, uh, deal we get off of the flyers you hand out, I'll pay you a thousand dollars. And they'll be like, well, how do you know it came from me? Because you have a totally unique phone number. Mm -hmm. You know, you have an, have an initial organizing meeting for all your bird dogs. You do that on zoom and they'll be like, well, how do you know that my leads didn't come from, right? If you, well, you have a separate phone number and you got a separate phone number and you got a separate phone number. You got a separate website and you got a separate website. Like all the leads that come from your efforts, I'll be able to track. And that way you can tell, you know, why is it that so-and-so has so many more leads than the other, than the other guy? Because one of them is telling you the truth that they are going out every day and every Saturday and the other one's lying to you. And those flyers are going in the trash can as opposed to actually being handed out. By tracking and measuring, we can actually improve the performance. And then at some point when you get the performance where you need for it to be, Turn that over to your virtual assistant too. Your job is to look at the metrics or your job is to run the spreadsheets. And then once a week, we're gonna to get together during staff meeting time and look over our numbers. Initially you do, and then you hand it over to somebody else. And as my mentor once said to me, you never get what you expect, you only get what you inspect. So having the ability to track and have metrics and keeping it simple, is the best way to inspect. That makes sense? Yes. Thank so you. yeah, you can use MailChimp for that. You can use MailChimp and, and your Facebook page. You can set up different posts inside the Facebook page and you can link the domain name for the websites to the different posts in the Facebook page. So if you have, you know, um, at your service Hyattsville, well, at your service Hyattsville.com goes to one video in your Facebook page and at your service, capitalheights.com goes to another. Okay. Make sense? Yes, thank okay. you. And again, and again, it's like everything else in this business, the more you do it, the easier it becomes and um, the easier it is to automate. But the key is, the key is always from the very beginning, just keep it simple. Fewer moving pieces, fewer things to break. Once you get comfortable with your basic sort of, um, I got houses to sell and using your Facebook page to communicate, to build your buyers list. And you get real comfortable uploading videos and shooting videos and, and redirecting URLs, then ease on into using it for other purposes. But okay. start, you know, crawl, walk, run, win gold medal, start slow, go faster. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. All right. Anybody else? Anybody else got any questions? Tari, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Unmute yourself and ask your question. Ask away. Yes, dear. I was typing it. <laughs> okay. So, no worries. Um, but you want me to type it or? No, no, no. You're you're, you're unmuted now. Go ahead. Okay. On ask the doc on the document titled "The Assignment of Contract to Purchase Real Estate." Yes. 
is the LLC that's being assigned supposed to be included in within that document or just- I gave you too that? many documents because now you're confused. You have two assignment documents, one for assigning a contract, one for assigning an LLC. Make oh. sure you don't confuse them. Wait a minute. That's what happens when Sherman gives too much stuff. <laughs> <laughs> that's my fault, not yours. No, no. <laughs> And everybody, everybody be like, Sherman, can I get all 125 of your slides <laughs> up front day one? <laughs> no. <laughs> so again, I, I gave you the week three book uh, several days ago. And in there you have assignment of LLC and assignment yep. of contract and sample contract. And I said, and my apologies, because I probably didn't stress it enough. I gave you a sample contract and I gave you a sample assignment of contract because as you start coming across opportunities to do FISBO deals, you're not going to use a border realtor contract. And again, those are watermarked for educational purposes only because before you start using any of that stuff, you need, really do need to sit down with a competent attorney and have them review it. Right. Okay. okay, I see it now. Um, no worries. So when, sorry? I said no worries. Okay, so when doing um, phase one, Yes. And, and assigning the, uh, as a part of doing the wholesales and assigning your interest in the LLC. First of all, your facial expression is stressing me. What? So we, need take, we, need, we need to take a step back and take a deep breath. Well, I'm tired. It's just late. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. All right, so let's take a deep breath. Without <laughs> slowly. Shake it out, shake it out, shake it out. All right, so phase one. Which uh -huh. one's first, phase one or phase two? One. One. Mm -hmm. In phase one, we're only going after deals in the MLS. Correct. And if we're only going after deals in the MLS, what kind of contract will we, will we be using? Board of Realtors. And the reason why we set up an LLC when using Board of Realtor contracts is because the Board of Realtor contracts has a clause in it that says this contract may only be assigned by what? Um, by, I can't remember. All right, can you remember this? Are all contracts assignable? Yes, I've stated in that Board of Realtors contract. All contracts are assignable. Say it with me. All contracts, all contracts are assignable. Are assignable. Mm -hmm. Unless, unless the contract itself says otherwise. Right. Okay. I just said that a different way, but okay. I understand. I understand. But I want you to repeat it back the same way Sherman said it. Okay. Get you out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, what gives us that power to assign contracts? What one document, one, one singular document gives us the power to do that? The last US, page. Sorry. The U.S. The United States. Oh, Constitution. Constitution. We have the constitutional right to assign a contract because a contract is considered property. And in the US, citizens can own property and citizens can pretty much do whatever they want with their property. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Property is not just real estate. Property is also personal property. I have a pen in my hands, in my hand. Can I give you this pen if I so choose? Yes. Can I charge you money for this pen? Yes. Okay. Because the constitution allows me to own property. Other countries like communist countries may very well limit a person's right to own property. Now, if I put a property under contract, do I have rights in that contract? Yes. Is the fact that I even have a contract valuable? Yes. And I can assign my position in that contract because the contract itself is property. Does that make sense? Yes. A contract itself is property just like the pen is, okay? Now, problem with border realtor contracts is all border realtor contracts say you can't assign them without mutual consent or mutual permission. They all use slightly different words, but they're essentially saying the same thing. Right. I can't assign the contract, the border realtor contract, without going back and getting the seller's permission. Correct. Can you think of one good reason I would want to go back and get the seller's permission to assign the contract? Not at the moment. Because there are none. 
<laughs> and even, if, even if you take 20 more moments or whatever, there are none. So how do, how do I create a situation where I can assign something without having to go back to get permission? I stated in a contract. No, no, no. You want to phone a friend? Sure, I'll phone a okay, friend. Okay, folks, put it in the chat box. Let's help three out. How do we create an opportunity to assign a contract where the contract itself says it's not assignable? And no, it's not the addendum. <laughs> but, but look, I don't want that for telling you. Some of you guys skipped over the first couple of days' lessons, and now you're going to start paying the price because this is going to bite you in the butt really hard. Okay. All right. No, it's not the weasel clause. All right. It is the LLC, but specifically why the LLC? Thank you, Al. The way we do it is we clone ourselves. Three, do you know what I mean when I say clone yourself? Thank you, Kennedy. Kennedy. Yes. Okay, what do I mean by cloning myself? In your own words, what does that mean to you? To create an entity yes. that uh, will represent yes. my interests. Absolutely. You're not as tired as you think you are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I clone myself. And it's the clone that's entering into the contract. And the clone that we use is an LLC. We form an LLC. And if we get the seller to agree to enter into a contract with my clone, my LLC, then I can sell my clone because my clone is also property. I know there's a lot of ethical things that go along with that. But we're not talking about human clones. We're talking about legal clones, entity clones. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So I can assign the entity and the contract goes with it. That's a little cumbersome. There's a couple of little extra steps we have to take. But the alternative is if we don't do that, we have to go back to the seller and get their written permission to assign the contract. And that just never ends well, because you're either faced with telling them the truth or lying to them. I never advocate you lie to anybody in a business relationship especially at the beginning. That will definitely end badly for you. If somebody says to me, why do you want to sign a contract? I give them some, as my mother would say, cock and bull story that is not the truth. And when they find out the truth, they're either going to be mad at me or sue me or both. Or I can tell them the truth, which is I'm assigning the contract because I'm going to make $10,000 more off of your property. In which case, they're still not happy with me. So the only right answer is avoid the conversation altogether. How do we avoid the conversation altogether? We take the additional step of creating the clone, the LLC, with the specific intention that at some point we will form a partnership and our partner will buy us out. Does that make sense? Yes. And we don't have to disclose any of that detail to the seller. Once the seller agrees to do business with an LLC, what happens behind the scenes is none of their business. Right. Okay. Right. Now, so, oh. If you're doing FISBO deals, by definition, what's a FISBO deal? What does FISBO stand for? For sale by owner. There is no realtor. And if there is no realtor, there's no realtor border contract. There's no border realtor contract. Use whatever contract you want, including contracts that don't say anything about assignability. And even if we use a contract that says nothing about assignability, we know for a fact that all contracts are assignable. Exactly. And that's why, and that's why I corrected you, by the way. I know, I know you wanted to say it your way, but I had to correct you because we need to get it in our heads. All contracts are assignable. Because when you start using non-border realtor contracts, you're going to be looking for the assignability clause, and there may not be one. And the simple fact of the matter is you don't need one. And the reason why you don't need one is because all contracts are assignable. Unless the contract itself states says otherwise. Something says something different. Now, the border realtor contracts do not prohibit assignability. You want to know why the border realtor contracts don't prohibit assignability? To protect the... No. Because the U.S. Constitution says oh, you can sign all contracts. Right, 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 right. So if the border realtors put something that was unconstitutional, they'd have lawsuits left and right. So, and again, I, I, I hate to sound like I'm nitpicky, but there's so many half-baked real estate agents out there running around acting like they're lawyers and they're not. They say stupid stuff like, well, you can't assign a board of realtor contract because assigning contracts is illegal. By the way, the first time you hear that come out of a real estate agent that you want to use, what do you think you should do? 
Fun. Exactly. <laughs> and, the fir- and by the way, and the first time you hear that come out of the mouth of a real estate agent who's representing a seller, what should you do? Run. No. Oh, no, say there's the money. <laughs> I got a rube. I got a newbie. I got somebody who doesn't have a clue what the hell they're doing. We're going to have fun tonight. <laughs> you with me? Yes. As lo- look, as long as the town idiot is on the other side of the fence, you're okay. okay. You just don't want them on your side of the fence. All right. You with me? So yes. all contracts are assignable unless the contract itself says otherwise. Therefore, when we step outside of the world of realtors, right? And what's that world called? Say that again. When we We step step outside outside of the world of realtors, what's the world that does not have realtors involved in transactions called? When it comes Uh, to- Fisbos, phase two. Exactly, when it comes to single family houses, you're only operating in two spheres. You're either operating with realtors or you're operating with Fisbos. There's nothing in between. So by definition, if we're not, if there's no realtor involved in the deal and I'm talking to somebody, it's a FISBO, pure and simple. So well, Sherman, what if it's a pre-foreclosure? What if you talk to a homeowner who maybe is in a distress situation they haven't decided what? It's a FISBO. If there's no real estate agent involved, by definition, it is a FISBO. Does that make sense to you? Yes. And you, that's not the first time you're hearing it either. Absolutely not. You, you heard me <laughs> talk about this like week one, week two, right? Yes. Okay, that was the foundational stuff, right? So here's the deal. If it's a FISBO, then we should not be using border realtor contracts. Ever. Ever. Well, can't we use a border realtor contract that we uh, amend it? That's a really bad idea. The contract I gave you guys, which we really didn't get too much into, and I'm not going to get too much into, it is a very much unilaterally written contract in favor of the buyer. Any, anybody here actually read that contract that I gave you guys? And I know that wasn't the emphasis. Like there's stuff in there that says things like, if we wind up going to court, the prevailing party does what? I don't remember okay. the detail. It, that's okay. I'll tell you what it says, because we didn't spend a lot of time on it, right? It says that if we wind up going to court, the prevailing party can collect um, reimbursement from the losing party. Okay. For legal fees. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now let's say you put a property under contract and the seller tries to pull a fast one and sell the property to somebody else. And you have to sue them for something called specific performance. First of all, who's the more sophisticated party in this transaction, you or the seller? Me. It ought to be you. You may not feel that way right now, but at some point, you know, you're going to have some experience under your belt. It's going to be you. Who is, for mo- who is far more likely to win in court? You or the seller? Mm, the seller? Why would if the seller I... be far more likely to win if you're more sophisticated? I'm sorry. I'm stinking lose. I mean, first of all, <laughs> if, you, if you actually thought you were going to lose, you wouldn't even go to court. No, no, I'm sorry. I, when you said that, I thought I was thinking sell or lose. <laughs> okay, but so see, here's the here's the point that a lot of people don't grasp, and I'm gonna take it easy on you, Tariq, because I know you're tired, so I'm gonna let you off the hook a little bit, right? Most contracts are not neutral. Most contracts are not new. Most contracts are either written to favor one side or the other. Mm-hmm. Now, border realtor contracts try to be neutral. But in addition to protecting the buyer and seller, who else are the board of realtor contracts trying to, trying to protect? The agents. The realtors, exactly. So it's got all kinds of stuff in there about the protection of the broker and protection of the agent, both. But the board of realtor contract is a fairly neutral, it's, it's, it's about as neutral as you can get. You don't want to use neutral contracts. When you're buying, you want contracts that favor you as the buyer. And when you're selling, you want contracts that favor you as the seller. Mm-hmm. Even something simple as the settlement date shall be such and such, unless the buyer needs 30 more days, and then the buyer needs to notify within 24 hours of settlement that they need 30 more days. Who does that favor? Uh, the buyer needs more days, it favors the buyer. Exactly. If- that contract I gave you is very much buyer slanted. Okay. You don't get that with a border realtor contract. That buyer, that contract, I believe, does have language on assignment, and it gives you all kinds of power on assignment. 
That contract says you're only going to put up $500 earnest money deposit and that it's good and valuable consideration held by your title. So in other words, there's all kinds of things in that contract that are much more favorable to you than they are to the seller. Well, Sherman, is that legal? Of course it is. All contracts, the only thing a contract is, is an agreement between a buyer and a seller. That's all it is. It's an agreement between two parties. If both parties sign it, unless there's something egregious in there, which is not, the fact that it favors you over the other side doesn't make it illegal. It just makes it a good contract that the other person probably should have had a lawyer read before they signed it. Right. But the simple fact of the matter is most people don't get lawyers to read anything. They just sign it. Well, if they're 21 years of age and then have right mental faculties, is that your fault? No. Nope. Not even. And I don't, when I say it's when I say it's written in your favor, I don't mean it's like taking you know full on advantage of somebody, but it is more favorable to you than it is to the other side. Little things like you can ask for another 30 days and they have to give it to you. Got it? Yes. Okay. So we're not going to use border realtor contracts when we're not doing border realtor deals. If we're doing FISBO deals, we are going to have a FISBO buyer oriented contract when we buy and a FISBO seller oriented contract when we sell. What I gave you in the week three documentation is a sample contract with a watermark because I am not a lawyer giving you legal advice. I am also at this point, not your broker giving you agent advice. Having said that, you can hire your agent to represent you on FISBO deals. You can do that. All of us can do that. I've done that. There's no rule that says agents can only represent you on border realtor deals. But when you're outside of border realtor transactions, you should not be using border realtor contracts. And because we're not using border realtor contracts and we can in fact assign the a contract without having to form an LLC, we don't form an LLC. It's, it's an additional step we don't have to take. And because we're not assigning the LLC, we need a separate assignment agreement that's specific to assigning the contract. That's what I gave you guys in that week three booklet, even though we didn't spend a lot of time going through it. Because you may very well during your 21 day journey, come across a FISBO. Not that you wanted it, not that you, not that you sought it out, but it just fell in your lap. And you don't wanna use a border realtor contract and you're not gonna use an assignability of LLC because you're not gonna form an LLC for the FISBO deals. Does that help? Yeah, I guess my, my original question was I was confused. Well, yeah, I was confused because I was thinking that this the assignment document would be used in phase one. But now I remember that the phase one assignments are part of the Board of Relatives contract. So well, not, not, only that, we're, not only that, but we're assigning something totally different. In a phase one deal, what exactly are we assigning? Our interest in the LLC. Exactly. Therefore, you're not going to assign the contract. There will be no assignment of contract in a phase one deal because you're not assigning the contract. Gotcha. You're assigning your ownership in your clone and your clone has the contract to buy the property. So whoever controls the clone controls the property. Got it. In a FISBO deal, a non-border realtor deal, there's no reason to form an LLC. There just isn't one. We don't need that additional step. We're just gonna put it under contract and assign the contract. So those two additional documents at the very end of the week three booklet are for mm -hmm. FISBO deals. Right. And hopefully, as, as, as well as the third page, that says um, user clauses. <laughs> let me let me pull that up real quick to make sure we're all on the same page. Oops. Sugar. I got so much stuff on my computer now. I've been creating so much content for this course. I've totally cluttered up my desktop. And when I open up these files now, they're saved in the cloud and the cloud has to download them, which takes a, which takes a quick second. All right, here we go. So can you see my screen okay? Yes. All right, so see how it says week three? Yes. Okay, let me open it up a little bit. So you've got your uh, AHA sheet, your daily tasks, your team roster, your buyer broker agreement, 
buyer broker agreement, buyer broker agreement, buyer broker agreement, four pages, your checklist for when you're meeting with your agent, your property uh, offer worksheet, um, your sample um, hard money lender letter, your sample earnest money deposit check. And again, these the, the sample earnest money deposit check is also what happens when you're using board of realtor contracts. Um, because you because you probably won't have your broker hold your EMD when you're doing physical deals. You, pro you probably will have the title company, but you're going to be putting a lot less money at risk. And the contract is much more one-sided in your favor, especially when it comes to the earnest money deposit. All right, then your cover sheet for submitting your offer, sample contract, and that goes through 11 pages. So I'm just going to jump down to the 11th page, sample addendum, going to jump down, tracking log, property inspection worksheet. And then after the property inspection worksheet is the sample assignment of interest in your LLC. Mm -hmm. That's what you need to assign the LLC when you're using board of realtor contracts. And that's two pages. Okay. Then you have a sample contract of sale. That's mm -hmm. what you use for your FISBO deals, not the board of realtor contract. Okay. And at some point, you guys may want to go through and read that and see how slanted it is in favor of the buyer. Okay. Um, and that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pages. All right. Mm -hmm. Not quite 11, seven. Um, and then you have the assignment of contract to purchase. Right. Which, so that yeah. assignment to purchase goes with the FISBO contract. And then the last thing I give you is this delightful, you know, weasel clauses. Notice how we talk about the fact that you only need one weasel clause for the board of realtor and you only want to use one weasel clause for the board of realtor. But when you start going after FISBO deals, here's a handful more, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine weasel clauses that you should feel free to use. But you only use them when you're dealing with FISBOs. You don't use them with board of realtor, okay? Things like buyer may place a sign on the property prior to closing for prospective tenants or buyers. You'd never get away with that in a board of realtor contract. <laughs> Only person wants to sign in the yard is the selling agent. <laughs> uh, I'll say listing agent. This contract is contingent upon approval of buyer's financial partner. You'll never get away with that in a board of realtor contract. The buyer makes in the closing date an additional 30 days by paying the seller $500 in cash. You ain't gonna get away with that in a board of realtor contract but you probably could get away with any one of these weasel clauses in a FISBO deal, okay? Seller allows buyer to make renovations and market said property before settlement. I mean, my goodness, we really are asking a lot, aren't we, right? Contract is contingent upon a suitable inspection. Well, what the heck does suitable inspection mean? And what's the deadline for the inspection? And when will the inspection start? What happens if I don't agree with inspection? In other words, all that stuff that's detailed in a full-on paragraph in a board of realtor contract, does not exist in your FISBO contract, but you can slip this little beauty in there and it says what it says what you want it to say. Got it? Yes. More sophisticated strategies or more sophisticated deal making when you get there. Yep. But the first order of business is we got to get what? First, deal. first deal done. And then set that up and set that system up. By the way, are you are you also now beginning to understand why phase one is so much simpler and easier than phase two? Yes. It's, it's, I mean, we're just, we're just using, we're hacking. It's like I said a couple of weeks, we're hacking the matrix. We're taking the stuff that the traditional real estate agents have set up decades ago and just slipping ourselves in and understanding how that works and hacking it to our advantage. Okay. Yes. Add a clause that says subject to spouse's approval. Uh, you can, as long as you're very specific that it's the buyer, but what if the buyer doesn't have a spouse? I mean, I mean, look, look, guys, don't get too cute. <laughs> don't get too cute because it may only come back and bite you in the butt. Okay. Where's the weasel clause in the realtor contract again? Okay. The, the weasel clause in the realtor contract is one and only one. And that goes in, and that goes where, where, where do we recommend that you put that one and only weasel clause in your contract? Anybody? Exactly. In the general addendum, in the general addendum. Okay. And that was, of course, covered on the day that we talked about writing offers, which I believe was day 12. Hard to believe. Seems like a lifetime ago, doesn't it? 
But day 12, we went through line by line, paragraph by paragraph, how to fill out the contract and how to fill out the general addendum, okay? Um, do not use board contracts with FISBOs. Uh, by board, you mean board of realtor. Um, yeah, do not, exactly. We do not use board of realtor contracts for anything other than board of realtor deals. We don't. And quite frankly, we shouldn't because the board of realtor contract has a, um, uh, whatchamacallit, a copyright indentia at the bottom. And it also has the name of the real estate agent who provided that contract for you. Um, so you're only technically supposed to be using the board of realtor contracts when you're using that realtor to be totally technical, right? Um, because everybody's using zip form. Like even when your diamond member, diamond agent, diamond coach gives you a batch of contracts or gives you one to go make copies off of, it will probably have their name at the bottom. And you should really only be using them if they're representing you. Because if you wind up, like if you don't know that, you make a boatload of copies and then you run off and start worrying somebody else. The first thing they're going to do is call up that other person and say, Hey, I just got this offer in. It's got your name on it. And that could really be a train wreck. So again, border realtor contracts are when we're going after border realtor deals. FISBO, we can use anything we want, including a piece of toilet paper. I just gave you a sample as something to get you started, but you're not going to go out there and use it in the street until you run it past the lawyer anyway. Um, and, and where, you know, which lawyer do you run it past? I'd go straight back to that title attorney who your diamond member or your investor agent introduced you to and say, Hey, by the way, I'm thinking about doing some FISBO deals. Can you help me with that too? Pretty sure they're going to go. Yes. Not every deal that gets done at a title company is a border realtor deal. And that's a good source to go to, to start having you either your contracts reviewed or having them give you a contract. A lot of title companies, especially ones we recommend do a lot of business with investors. And so they'll have their kind of favorite contracts. Um, I learned this very, very early on in the business. When I first started, and I got Steve to help me out and Rex Frost was my hard money lender. Um, even before I borrowed money from him, he did all of his work through Brennan and Brennan Title Company. In fact, um, Debbie Ingram, who used to be with Brennan and Brennan is still my attorney today, even though she's no longer with Brennan and Brennan. And Brennan and Brennan was his whole back office. Everything that got done, got done through that title company. And so he didn't have to go hire a bunch of people on payroll. Um, and, and that was just a part of the service they gave him for all the loans that he made. If he needed a legal document, the lawyers from Brennan and Brennan drafted it for him. So title attorneys generally have pretty good docs, uh, and it's a good place to go. I mean, you can take the one I gave you as sort of a starting point, but also have them review and also give, you know, their two cents worth because maybe they got some double sneaky clauses that are even better than the ones I suggested. Okay. All right. Tariq, you good? Give me a thumbs up. You good? Hey, Sherman. Yes. Uh, go ahead. Can you go over um, finding comps in the uh, for a property in the MLS? Sure. So Please. let me let me close a couple things and open a couple things. Um, do, 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 do. I have to log in first. As soon as I get logged in, I'll. <sighs> Yummy, great. <laughs> All right. So let me show screen. So I am in Bright MLS. So Bright MLS is the MLS for the Washington DC or what we call the matrix. And if I'm going to be looking at a property, first place I would start is up here with a search and then residential sale, okay? So I, do you have a specific address you want me to look at? Um, I just looked in HomeSnap. Uh, I just pulled up 613 Drum Avenue. All right, so, and again, this is from the realtor view, not necessarily the view that you right. have. Okay, so I'm gonna say within a quarter mile, and what's the address? 613 Drum Avenue, Capitol Heights. Okay, and you notice how it automatically populates for me? Uh-huh. Okay. So I'll click that. 
Um, and down at the very bottom, it tells me that there's five matches. I don't know. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Um, that's a little tight. So maybe I'll go out, although it's coming soon, active. Um, I want to see, I don't care about coming soon, but I, I do care about active under contract. I do care about pending and I definitely care about closed. All right. So you notice when I check those four boxes and uncheck this box, now it pops up to 38. Okay. Did you see that? Yep. Okay. And I can either click the 38 matches and have a list view, or I can click the map and it'll show me where they are in proximity to my subject property. Okay. Let's just go ahead and do a map. Let's go ahead and just do matches. So I'll click matches and I say search. And here's all the matches. Okay. ACT means active. PND means pending, which means there's a contract, but it hasn't closed yet. And CLS means closed. Okay. So since your view is different, I don't think that there's a match feature like that in HomeSnap. Do we just manually? Sure there is. There is? Okay. What I, what I would do in HomeSnap, and again, I'm on a desktop, not uh -huh. an iPad or an iPhone. What I would do in HomeSnap is pull up the closed and I would pull up probably the map feature and just start clicking on the ones that are in close proximity using the map feature. Okay. All right. So using, using the tools I have, right? The one thing I didn't filter was bedrooms. So any idea how many bedrooms? Uh, let's see what it says. Three bed, two bath. All right. So if I go back, and filter and just click revise, right? So still same property, same, still same proximity. And I can do, you know, I can do a 10th of a mile. Capital Heights is a little dense. I might want to do 10th of a mile. Notice how it dropped down to eight matches. Yeah. Okay. Now if I also add in bedrooms and bathrooms, so I'll say total bedrooms three, and I generally say three plus, because that means three or more. And I say total bathrooms, how many did you say you had? Two. And I'll say two plus, okay? So now I'm down to seven matches. If I hit the map feature, it should show me where they are. Okay, so here we go. There's my subject property, right? And then within a 10th of a mile radius, that's what's on the market right now. More or less, that's what you're gonna see in HomeSnap. Okay. I believe the reds are closed, I think. I think the greens are active and I think the oranges are pending. So all three categories can be used as comps? I would prefer to see closed or pending as opposed to active. Okay. But I'll look at all. Um, I don't quite have enough closed. So it's, again, assuming that red is closed, I only have three closed. So I might have to go out, geographically speaking, another. Like, so again, if I go back and refine it again, right? Sorry, let me go back. And now go to, now go to a quarter mile as opposed to a tenth of a mile, and again, say three plus bedrooms and two plus bathrooms. I'm down to 27 matches. Oops, sorry. I didn't want to click that. I wanted to click map. So quarter mile, three plus, two plus, active under contract, pending, closed. Then I click map. Now notice I'm out another, um, I was a tenth of a mile, now I'm a quarter mile. And notice how many more I have to pick from. Okay. And again, assuming the reds are closed, those are the ones I want to focus on first. Okay. Here's my subject property. Pick the ones that are closed, the red ones closest to. So I've got a 185, and that's a five bedroom, three bath. I got um, 270. I got 322. Okay. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to pick the list view as opposed to the map view. Because the main thing is like, am I still like, if I do this, am I still in Capitol Heights? Uh, well, there's a little portion off to the upper left-hand corner that kind of goes into DC. Exactly. Okay. And if I've been driving the neighborhood, right. Mm -hmm. And I've got my ADC map or my, uh, what was the other, what was the other, who's the other company? Not ADC. Rand McNally. I got my Rand McNally map. Mm -hmm. I'm paying attention to where does one neighborhood begin another neighborhood in. Mm -hmm. 
Right. So first of all, I got Central Avenue right here. Let me blow this up a little bit for everybody. Oops, too much. I got Central Avenue right here. Is stuff on the north side of Central different than the south side of Central for anybody who's driven around and knows the difference? You said yes. Absolutely. North of Central is Seat Pleasant. South of Central really is Capitol Heights. Okay, then I got this Capitol thing. Heights. Right. Then I got this thing called Southern Avenue. Well, Southern Avenue is what? The dividing line between DC and Prince George's mm -hmm. County. Is stuff in DC different than the stuff in Prince George's? Yes. Absolutely. Now, the radius doesn't care. It's just drawing. However, in the search that I did, mm -hmm. um, well, the search that I did should have picked up DC if stuff was available in DC. So this little sliver of DC, nothing was available. If I were to go out further, I would start picking up DC properties. And I have to, and, and I have to know that DC is not Prince George's. Got it? Got it. Okay. So, but for the most part, all these little houses in here that are available really are all capital height. So any one of these is viable. Any one of a quarter mile is viable. If, 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 I, if uh, an appraiser is going to use any one of these, but obviously the stuff that's closer to the subject is going to be um, more important. However, I want to shift to a list view because I want to actually see the pictures of the houses. Yeah. The, um, the map view doesn't actually show us the houses. Okay. So let me go back again, make sure my criteria hasn't changed, which it hasn't, quarter up, quarter mile, right? Um, make sure I put in three plus, two plus. I don't want to change my criteria. I got 27 matches. I'm just going to go ahead and click the matches. When I click the matches, it should give me an actual list view. So here's an actual list view. Notice the list is much smaller um, because I, I, I did a, a bedroom select. Uh -huh. So the list was wind, wind up being a little bit smaller. Now, I want to kind of focus on the threes, the three twos, not so much the four threes and the five fours. Now, um, do we know anything about the house at all? Have we visited the house yet? No, I just looked at the picture. So it's the fourth house on the list. So. Okay. So if that be the case, I can either look at all 27 properties, which nothing wrong with that, or I can just so sort of go through and just sort of select, you know, starting with the ones that are closed, then working on the ones that are pending maybe out of curiosity, looking at the active, because maybe the active is the stuff that's been rehabbed and I can sort of see what people yeah. are thinking. Okay. So let's just, for, for this purpose, why don't we just go through and look, it's not many, let's just go through and look at them. Let's go look at them. So here's the first one up and there's the picture, right? And that one looks like it's been rehabbed. In fact, you know what? <laughs> that's funny. That looks like um, um, Paris Bunkley's house. Remember Paris made $90,000 on a rehab? That actually looks kind of like her house. Um, no, this house has been redone recently. Look at that. Oh, that that's gorgeous. a comp that you would use. Sorry? So this property here would be one of the comps that you would reference to the potential buyer. Never. Not even. Yeah. Oh, never. Okay. This, this, this is, first of all, again, this is an active. Uh-huh. I don't know it's active because it says active. Okay. I, I would look at this property, but I wouldn't reference it to the buyer. I would look at this property as what's the potential when I finish my rehab. Uh, so that would that be looked at as like one like the, for the ARV? Would we use this for no, the ARV? No. Yeah. Good okay. questions though. We would never use this as an ARV because it's not closed. It's active. Okay. And if it were closed? If it were closed, I might use it. But understand okay. this. This is telling you what the house could look like after you rehab it. Right, right. Is this going to be on the high end or the low end? Okay. No, no, answer the question. Is it going oh, to be on the high end? In comparison to the to 613? Is this going to be on the high end of, of the 27 properties we're looking at? Do we expect this one to be on the high end or the low end? I'm not certain. I guess the high think, end. Think about the question before you answer it. Then just think. Just think. Okay. This house, looking at the pictures, yeah. is it recently renovated or is it old and decrepit? Oh, it's recently. So right. therefore, do you expect it to be on the high end or the low end? The high end. The highest. <laughs> yeah. I mean, okay. just look at the quality of the rehab. By the way, this also right. tells you what rehabbers are doing in the neighborhood. Yeah. This is like gives you gold. I mean, it's like I can't get in the property. Yeah. But I can do a virtual tour from my house in my PJs. Right. This tell so would I look at this property? Absolutely. Would I factor in the price when I make my offer? Definitely not. But this tells you what the potential is once the house goes for full-on rehab. 
And it also tells you the level of quality that people are doing with their rehabs. Okay. This house is gorgeous. Look at that floor. By the way, that's not wood. That is a, um, um, a recycled, um, it's a recycled rubber product that looks and feels like wood. Very, very popular, very eco. I mean, yeah, with, without even visiting the house, you can kind of feel what this house is all about. Yeah. Okay. And again, you can do this with Homestap. I, I'm mm -hmm. coming at it through the MLS, but you can do this with the Homestap tool. All right. So that's number one. Now, again, if I go back to the list, so agent one line, if I go back to this list, notice that was 708 Elfin. It's a 4-3. It may have started off as a 3-2, but they probably did some stuff. And it's on the market for 340. Right. Okay? But it's active. ACT, it's active. Okay. It's one tenth of a mile away, so it's relatively close, but it's active. We're not going to use that. We're only going to use closed and pending. Okay. So let's just let's just jump. I was going to go sort of like go through each one. Yeah. And this is your property, five two three drum. No, the two two below six one three. Six one three. Okay. So here's your property here, right? And it's old and stanky. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But. Again, by looking at some of those other properties that are inactive on the market now, you can sort of get a feel for what it could be. Yeah. I mean, it's old. I mean, look at these, look at these curved arches. That's old. That, that's original kind of stuff. Look, there's no crown molding anywhere. Look at this plaster ceiling. I don't know if it's plaster because it's smooth as a baby's behind, right? So this house was probably built 1940 something and hasn't been touched really since but the floor is gorgeous yeah they kept they kept whoever it was they knew how to keep a floor but notice like look how old this is now they did redo the kitchen look at the look at the floor right you got some ceramic tile you got some granite countertops you got some maple cabinetry you got a relatively new refrigerator right but this was not a full-on rehab this is something that the homeowner probably did why do i know that look at this fan look at this yeah exhaust fan right that 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 exhaust like there's no hood over the stove, you just got this old exhaust fan that's old as dirt. That, that thing's got 70 years worth of bacon grease stuck in there, all right? I'm telling you, all right? It's nice, it's nice, but it's not a full-on rehab, okay? There's nothing, I mean, they installed a ceiling fan, but there's nothing really, there's nothing terribly exciting going on about this house, right? These closets, doors are old as dirt, right? You can even tell just from the grain of the wood. Who hangs doors that have has wood grain going horizontally? Most wood grain goes vertically, right? But back in the 40s, that was the style. Mm -hmm. And there's no real great room. There's no like look at this bathroom. Oh my God, you got pink salmon tile with the with the black highlight. It's not bad, but that is very retro, sort of 40s, 50s look. That might even be the original. cute but that's not what people want to see today right same with this sort of staircase that's just sort of you know it's 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 dull there's nothing interesting about it right oh my god look at that thing i guess that's a bedroom at the top of the stairwell <laughs> Jeez. you just gotta walk around and hope that you don't have insomnia and trip and fall down straight down no. I don't, know. don't put any kids up here they start bouncing off the bed and boom Ouch, look at that roof. I mean, that's that that's the pitch of the roof, right? Yeah. That's right. So, in any event, I guess that's the basement. Yeah, I think that's the basement mm -hmm. window. Not bad. And it's carpeted. So you're gonna know the second you walk in it whether or not they got a flooding problem. How would you know if they got a flooding problem the second you walk? It's gonna smell like right, like a swamp. Yeah. Now it probably does smell like a dog. Because they have a dog, yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's a puppy. How many times do you think that puppy's peed on a peed on a carpet? Use that to your advantage. That's kind of ugly right here. See that? It looks like the basement bathroom. Right? Yeah, notice how it's just kind of like, wow, what's happening there, man? So so bottom line is the homeowner spent some money to fix it up a little bit, yeah. but not enough. And the one thing that's missing, tell me what's the one thing that's missing as we go through all these pictures. What's the one thing that you're not seeing? What are they hiding from us? The 8 
I don't know. We didn't see anything. I don't know if that's typically shown. Yeah, there's well, there's there's no real pictures of the roof, and and that picture of the backyard is kind of dinky. Normally, mm -hmm. like normally, when somebody's really really proud of the house mm -hmm. or a real estate agents listing it, it'll be like fifty pages, fifty photos, and there'll be like four or five photos, right? The same stuff. All right, so there, here we go. Now I said I kept on saying forties. This house was actually built in the nineteen sixties. Which is kind of weird. That's kind of weird because that bathroom did not look 1960s, but it says 1960s. Square footage above grade is 1,000, uh, 1,100 square feet. Three bedrooms, two baths. Um, when I look at a house, as I'm looking at it through the eyes of like a wholesaler, mm -hmm. I, I want to kind of position myself as the same way as a rehabber. Excuse me. Um, this house has sort of that little upstairs, but because of the roof line, there's not much you can do with it. Mm -hmm. And you might be able to, if I was a rehabber, I might be inclined to sort of enclose this space here. If I enclose this space here, I can bump out and get a whole lot more livable space. Mm -hmm. So that might be, but that really starts to add up to your costs in terms of the rehab costs. Um, so I would, again, just sort of keep it simple. And as I go through and look at properties that are comps, I really want to look at properties that are not fully tricked out. Like that first one we looked at. I want to just sort of look at what's some of the basic houses in the neighborhood. Um, let me go back to my list view. Oh, my agent one line. So here's my subject 613 and it's a three, two, um, asking 283, which is way too much. Um, but let's start looking at my closed. All right. So three twos, do we have any three twos? Not really. But I got some four two. So I'm going to look at my four two. It's a it's a tenth of a mile away, 4913 emo. I'm gonna look at this four two. I'm gonna look at this four one one four. That's like four one full bath, one half bath. What's a half bath? A bathroom without shower or tub, just toilet and sink. I'm gonna look at this three one. I'm gonna look at this four two. And that's about it. I'm not, oh, and this three, two, right? I'm not looking at any five threes. House ain't big enough to get five bedrooms out of, right? And so just quickly scanning it, I'm seeing, you know, 275, 303, 265, 255, 340, 265. So my range um, is really Sort of two, 255 is the lowest, right? 255 to 275. There is a 340, well, but the 340 yeah, is a 403. You have the 303 marked off. Sorry? I think you have the 303. 303. 30. Oh, yeah, you're right. Sorry. And the 303. All right, so let's look at these. Look at Let's look at these houses, the ones that I've actually marked. Okay? So I think I click. Well, we'll just go put each one. So this is emo. So that's kind of similar. Mm -hmm. Our house was how many square feet? 1104. Right. So this one's only a thousand. So it's a little bit smaller. But somebody did, I mean, somebody looks like they did a little bit of work. Definitely did some work on the inside. That, out, that house is, I mean, it's a small house, but somebody put some work into it. Maybe even blew out a couple of walls just to give you some more open space. not a lot of work, but it's not a lot of house to work with. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's a comp. Even though it's smaller, it's a comp. And even though it's redone? Sure. Okay. Because it's closed. Now, what did it close at? Okay. Uh, close at 265. Okay. That's my upper end. Okay, close the 265, that's my upper end. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Oh my goodness, he's all over the place. He's all over the place today, okay. Next, so that was emo. Next one, 624 Opus. Now that one closed at 340, that's the highest one. Now, is that a comp? No. Not even, totally different housing type. Yeah. This is a, this is a split foyer, much newer, much bigger. Not even a comp. 
take that one off the list. So the 340, and that, you know, and, and that's what you'll see in Capitol Heights. Right. It's a lot more eclectic than, say, like, you know, a neighborhood in Bowie. All right, next one, 814 Elfin, 255. It's a 411. Uh, 952 square feet. Much smaller house. All right, is that a comp? Uh, yeah. Looks similar. Yeah, yeah. looks very similar. It's pretty similar. Now, uh, granted, they went all crazy with the stone on the front. Who knows who the heck did that? I doubt it was the rehabber. Um, little more going on with the yard. Nice stonework. That's a lot of money, but they'll never get the money back out. That's a lot of money for some stone. Mm. Fixed up. Not a fabulous fix up, but you know, I got my stove. I've got my microwave. I've got my fan underneath. I got some maple cabinets or maybe like a cherry wood cabinet. I got some basic appliances, not much on the splash board, but I do have a granite countertop. This scares me a little bit and this scares me a lot. You see that? That's nasty. Are you guys seeing what I'm seeing? On that door? Okay. And I'm also seeing this like little seam thing going on. Mm -hmm. Like right, oops. Come on now, fast fingers. Right here, do you guys see what's going on with this tile work? Mm -hmm. On this little sort of half wall, knee wall they call it. I don't like that. Look how dirty the floor is by the way. See how dirty the grout is? That bothers me a little bit. And I, and I don't know if this is the photo, but I'm having like a little hump situation. It might just be the photo. That's actually a marble countertop. Well, no, it's granite. That's granite, sorry. That's about the extent of the house, by the way. <laughs> it's not a very big house. Okay. So somebody did rehab this house. They just didn't spend a lot of money on it. Mm -hmm. But again, this is a closed, so it did sell. Not crazy about these accordion closet doors. That's somebody really went all cheapo on the rehab on this one. <laughs> I don't know why that's filthy looking like it is, but it is pretty filthy looking. I mean, it's quite possible. I mean, this is, I don't know. I don't think this is a new rehab. Maybe somebody bought it or maybe the rehab that rented it. Now they're ready to sell it, but it just kind of looks filthy. The whole house looks a little dirty. And that's not the way a house should look when you list it. It's also not the way it should look after a, re, a totally new rehab. So is that leaves? What the hell is that? It might be out the other person's property, like outside of the window. Oh, the, oh, I see. The window's open and that's a fence. Oh, okay. That's what that is. On the other side. Of, yeah. 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 You're right. The, the window's open. Looking at the siding of the other property. Yeah. Now the bathroom looks kind of nice. It looks kind of nice. Looks like it did a good job there. Definitely new toilet, new sink, nice little, little pedestal sink. And they're kind of cute. They're kind of teeny to fit in teeny spaces. Mm -hmm. That's definitely kind of new. You know, that sort of turn that little sink. This is very popular in, in England where the houses aren't very big. I don't know what's going on here with the wall, though. That's that's weird. And I really hate these accordion doors. <laughs> that's just that just that just bugs the bejesus out of me. <laughs> and I think it would I think it would bug a, a, a buyer, too. But again, the house closed. Right. Uh, very common to see these stackable units. Um, nice yard. I mean, they spent some buku bucks on the landscaping. The fence is really nice and very expensive. The retaining wall looks really, really good. Brand new air conditioning unit, probably about a three ton unit, you know, with a cage around it because you got to put a cage or otherwise somebody come along and steal it. Hmm. Yeah, it looks, I mean, the best, I mean, they spent some money on the landscaping. Most rehabbers don't spend that kind of money on the landscaping. But that backyard looks fantastic, it really does. And no clear signs of any kind of leaking, no place to get any water intrusion. This I don't even know if it has a basement because it looks kind of slab on gradish. You know, there's no well going down. Oftentimes when it rains, water gets into that well and flood the basement, not seeing any of that kind of potential. Everything's nice and lifted off the ground. Everything's lifted off the ground. 
good backyard. And again, a lot of money spent. In the, I mean, this landscaping is crazy. I don't know if the previous homeowner did that. I doubt the rehabber spent that kind of money. All the stone, all the slate leading up to the house, that's this, all the slate work. That's very expensive. That would not be a traditional or a typical rehabber. And I think we're coming in. There was 34 pictures and this is, yeah, that's it. Okay. So we're back to kind of being, so that's a good comp, okay. right? It, 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 it does show you, it did close. What did it sell for? So originally listed for 259.9, they closed at 255. So they took, had to take a little bit of a haircut. Uh, across the river agent, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. On the market for two months, 62 days. Okay. okay. That's a decent comp. Again, it's slightly smaller than ours, um, but that's okay. So that was 814 Elfin. And then we got uh, a 311. Uh, oh no, actually that's different. Okay. So we got three, we got a 311, uh, 5645 Southern. Now that's on the Prince George's side and across the street is DC. Um, 1100 square feet, just like our subject property, but this one's got a garage. Okay. This one, this one, we already, we already know this one has not been touched, right? We know that, right? How do we know that? Awnings, overgrown trees, right? We know that no rehabber has touched this house yet. So, you know, kitchen that was probably redone 20 years ago would have to be redone again because nobody's going to do it like this now. The kind of Ikea cabinets with the Zord, very plain Jane fronts. Backsplash is really kind of ugly with the two by twos. And I think this is Corian. Corian is sort of a fake faux uh, marble and it looks like it. That stove is old as dirt. As well as that refrigerator. So this is, this is going to wind up, it, it, this could either be a rental or a total gut rehab. Solid bathroom, but it's old as it's old as the hills, right? Nothing like the ones we've seen on the other properties. Again, another good comp. Because again, what's our objective when we buy? Buy low. Exactly. So we're going to see a range of values, and our offer is based on the low, not the high. This is probably the basement, basement bar. You can tell by the window up here, mm -hmm. the roof line. It's been a few bucks. The basement's pretty decent as basements go. You know, it's a finished basement. Except for that, that's kind of looking scary. I guess they got an extra fridge and an extra freezer in the basement. Mm -hmm. That's kind of scary looking. But, you know, again, no apparent water damage. That electrical service, I would want to ask my electrician if it has to be upgraded. I don't think that's, a, I think that electrical service is like a night circa 1980s. Very dark, closed in spaces, very typical. Not much of a backyard. You notice how dramatically different it is than the other one we were looking at? That air conditioning unit is old as dirt. That's probably 20 plus years old, ready to go. It needs to be replaced. Look at that shed. It's so overgrown. Ain't nothing in there but snakes. Mm. Okie dokie. Okay. So that's the end of that tour. That property um, did close. So they wanted 289. They got 265. Okay. Um, days on market 12. Not bad. Mm. Not bad at all. All right, so that's a comp. So what are our numbers looking like? We said you we have uh, 265, 255, 265. Okay. Um, let's look at this one that's a 4-2. It went for 303 just for kicks. 733 Nova. That one is 1700. How much was our how many square feet is ours? 1104. Okay, these are not comps. Yeah. Okay, that house is very, this house is very different. Mm -hmm. Difference in age, difference in size, different in architecture. That's not a comp. We're not going to use that one. All right. So we got two. And then we got this one. We got a 3 2, 275, 801 Mentor Avenue. 
That's a cop. I know it's got a carport, mm -hmm. right? And it's got all new siding, so it's definitely been rehabbed, top to bottom. All right, what was the square footage? 1,200 square feet. Okay. Estimated, estimated. That's not from the appraiser. So that is probably comparable. Now, it says year built 2019. That means they did a major rehab uh, two years ago. This house was definitely not built in 2019, okay? It's just a house that was totally redone. Notice, brand new air conditioning unit, relatively small. That's a two-ton with a cage mm -hmm. around it. But look at that roof line. That roof is brand new. That soffit, that's the area, that's the area that runs along, that's sort of baseboard that runs along the roof line. That's called a soffit. That's mm -hmm. new. This is all new siding. This foundation looks wonderful. Okay. Home sweet home. Oh. Okay. Now they took basically what was a carport mm -hmm. and just sort of, and they're just sort of a closed in porch. And notice this. This is a bump out. They added that in. That's mm -hmm. been added. That original roof line came down like that. That original house probably ended right about here. So mm -hmm. that's why they're saying the house was quote unquote built in 2019, because they just added a major addition to it. That's also why they're picking up an extra 100 square feet. Yeah. Instead, a, a an extra 10 by 10 room is 100 square feet. A little dark. I mean, for a new rehab, that's a little dark. I guess they just chose to go with that very sort of, you know, ponderous, masculine, dark wood, dark colors, gray. They, this, this here, you see how this is open up right here? Yeah. They open that wall up and in opening up that wall, they create a little more space, but they probably also had to add a couple of support beams to make that happen. Mm -hmm. And I suspect this room back here is an addition, giving them an extra hundred square feet, which is why it's 1200, not 1100. Relatively small kitchen, relatively small, but it gives, but you get the feeling that's a little more spacious because they took this wall out. Right. Okay. Kind of nice. Look at the bathroom. They got a lot of marble going on there. So that's been re totally rehabbed. This is probably that new room on the back. And again, it's, it's, it's a little bit more than 10. It's, this is more than 10 feet. This is probably more like 12. This is probably about 12 feet. And again, this going this space, which is hard to see right now, might be 10. But if you say it's 10 by 12, that's 120 square feet more than your, than your subject property. Mm -hmm. You can smell that new carpet. It looks pretty good. It's really good. And that's about it. They really don't give you any backyard photos, probably because they don't have any backyard, because when they built this addition, it probably chewed up the backyard. Mm -hmm. um, so, but it looks good. All right, so that one went for, so this one, this one is uh, 138 square feet more than yours, so it's probably that addition to the back, mm -hmm. probably same house. It says it was built in 2019, but that was just the year it was rehabbed. It was probably about the same age as yours. Um, and this one went for, it was listed for 285, but it was on the market for 56 days, probably because they were asking too much money. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it, what did it close for? What did it close for? So this is 801 Mentor. Ultimately, it closed for 275. So it closed down 10 grand less than what they were asking. So those, those are really your comps, right? 265, 255, 275. Which number are you going to use to, for, to make your offer? Uh, the 255. Bingo. So your mail form is going to be based on the 255. Okay. And just speaking of the mail formula, based off of the, uh, the subject property. I'm a little closer to your microphone. I can't Okay. Hear Looking at the subject property, I know our contractor would tell us typically how much work should go into it, right? For yeah, the but, you know, again, if you sort of look at the comps, yeah. You know, this this property here that we just looked at, right? Mm -hmm. Again, because they added another room to the house, that's that starts to get a little expensive. Um, that was probably about a fifty or sixty five thousand dollar rehab. They blew out a lot of walls, they added another room. They didn't do anything like add another bathroom though. So the stuff that really gets expensive is when you start adding bathrooms and stuff. So you think the same I can use either 55 or 50 or 60. I would, you know, for an initial, just throw it out there. I would probably use 50. Okay. If you start getting into major, major rehab, kind of like that, um, what was it? The 340. Uh -huh. 
this one. When you start getting into, sorry, there's something wacky going on with my mouse here. I may need to replace the batteries. When you start getting into, you know, a lot of granite, a lot of moving walls, recessed lighting, right? Totally new floor, Wayne's coating, you know, all, look at, look at, I mean, just look at the quality, all of this recessed lighting mm -hmm. and stuff. Um, they, they, they definitely relocated the staircase, right? Yeah. On this, like when you get into that, that, that starts to be like a hundred thousand dollar rehab. Okay. Like, so look yeah, at more is, of the basics. This, this, this house was not built originally like this. Yeah. They, th that, you know, when you start moving stuff around to that extent and putting in the level of quality, like with the, 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 the chair railing and the Wayne's coating, you know, all that little sort of gingerbread trim on the inside and, you know, just looking at the quality uh, with the Listello, the quality of the, the bathroom now, the quality of the kitchen now, that's, this is probably a hundred thousand dollar rehab. Okay. So don't use that. Obviously. No, you're definitely not going to use that a, because it's not a close. That's a, that's yeah. a, that's a, that's an active. And, right. but, but what it tells you is what the real potential is. And it also tells you the quality of rehabbing that's being done in that neighborhood. Right. Okay. But I would, but I would make your offer based on these three comps we saw, 255, 265, 275, and roughly about a $50,000 rehab budget. Perfect. To start. Now, you make highest and best. You get out there with your contractor. You get on the phone, start talking to some active rehabbers. Like, one of the things, I, first thing I do is see if you can find out who owns this one. See, the, another way you could use your home snap or MLS or, or um, um, Real Investors Mobile MLS is start pulling some of these ones that are active. Mm -hmm. And then do a search, then do a search and find out who actually owns them. Do a, do a search. You can do a search on Estat to find yeah. out who actually owns them and see if you can independently reach out and talk to some of these rehabbers. And once you get your property under contract, go talk to them and say, hey, I got another property in Capitol Heights. Like this is another one that's totally tricked out. Look at this. But how do you find the rehabber? The, well, the individual. Okay. This house right here, uh -huh. right, is located at. 523 Drum Avenue, right? I've looked this up before. Okay. So if I go to SDAT. I think it's an LLC that owns that one. Right. But we can well, find it's that. It's Maryland LLC, right? Right. So I'm going to look for real property in Prince George's County. Street address. What was the street address I gave you? Do you remember? Oh, I, can look, I can go back and look. 523 drum. So I put 523 drum and it gives me NMB Realty Group LLC. Right. Here's the problem. Where are they located? Alexandria. So therefore, it's most likely what kind of an LLC? Uh, Virginia. Virginia, most likely. But we'll look anyway. Okay. So now I come back to the same SDAT right? And instead of looking for property, I look for business. And I do a business oh, entity search. Oh, okay. Right, right. And I, and I paste in the name of the, of the LLC. Uh -huh. And oh my gosh, it happens to be a Maryland LLC. Yeah. Somebody was actually paying attention in class. And I click on the name of the LLC. And it tells me that it is a foreign LLC. So they were not paying attention because you know what's going to happen when they go to settlement. They have to pay the 6% tax. Hello. So now I've hit the filing history, I hit the registration. And NMB Realty LLC formed in Virginia, located at 1701 Duke Street. Formed in Virginia. So if I want to, I can go to the Virginia website, which is another step and actually see if I can find. So this is just a non-Maryland limited. No, this is them registering as a foreign entity to do business. Yeah. No. So let's just say, so I would contact them, but how do you get the name whoa, of- Whoa, 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 contact who? The, you were saying I could find out who owns the home, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. or who and purchased NMB, the home. NMB Realty Group owns the home. Right. But that's not going to help me. So actually- What do you mean it's not going to help you? It's not going to help you what? I was just going to backtrack. You said I can find out who owns the home, contact them for what purpose? To see if they want to buy any more houses in the neighborhood. Ah, uh, I got it. I got it. Okay. All right. Again, if I'm going through the MLS yeah. and I'm finding properties that have clearly been rehabbed. Oh, so they're potential buyers. Right. 
this yeah. house has clearly been rehabbed. Right, right. On somebody who knows what they're doing. So, mm -hmm. okay, who owns the house? The yeah. address is 708 Elfin. So I go to Estat and I go to the part of Estat that deals with property, not businesses. And I type in Prince George's County and mm -hmm. I type in the street address. And the street address was 708 Elfin, E L F I N, 708 E L F I N. I hit next. And this one's actually owned by a couple David Bryan yeah. or Bryan. Well, that's Brian who David. purchased Brian it. And Tamara <laughs> David. Does that, could they be, oh no, this is still pending. That, that, um... no, no, whoa, 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 why are you getting ahead of me? <laughs> All right, go ahead. You be student, I be teacher. You got it. All right. So again, we're in the matrix. We have a property that is listed for sale. It's active. That's what okay. active means. You with me? Uh -huh. I click on the listing. I bring up the picture. And again, all of the stuff you can do using the yeah. mobile app. Everything I'm showing you, you can use doing the mobile. I just happen to be on my, on my desktop, right? Mm -hmm. I see the property. I look at the pictures. I go, mm, this property has been rehabbed. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it's been rehabbed to a very high degree. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I stop looking at the property. I jot down the address. I run over to Estat and I plug in the address and it tells me the house is owned by Brian P and Tamara David who live at 14613 Argos Place. They own that house, they're selling that house. I looked to see when it was purchased. They purchased that property um, in 2007. Okay, from somebody named Watson Construction. <clears throat> Is it safe to say that this house has had a rehab more recent than 2007. Yes. Are, are, are we believing that this is a rehab from 13, from what was that, 13 years ago? No, this is recent. Exactly. Therefore, why not reach out to Brian and Tamara David at 14613 Argos Place and say, hey, I see you have a house for sale at 708 Elfin. Mm -hmm. Are you a rehabber? Are you interested in any more properties in Capitol Heights? Got it. They may very well say, well, no, that was a house we lived in and we fixed it up to sell it, but we're not really in the business. Okay, great. Hmm. Except this was a non, okay, I see what happened. Looks like, they, it looks like Brian David owned the house. Yeah. And then he got, and possibly, possibly, he got married in 2007 and put his wife on the deed. Hmm. Okay. But this house is owned by this couple today at this address. Okay. Is that something you could hand over to your virtual assistant and say, hey, track down this guy and see if he's interested in buying any more properties in Capitol Heights? Yes. Bingo. All day long. All right. And you can just go through off of your search and see, hey, are there any other active properties mm -hmm. that look like they've been recently rehabbed? All right. Here's another one. Does that look like it's been yeah. recently rehabbed? I mean, look at a fence. Yeah. Who has a fence and green grass like that in Capitol Heights except for a rehabber? Look at that. Oh my God. It's like leave it to Beaver. It's amazing what's going on in Capitol Heights right now. Look at that. Now this one kind of looks a little lived in. I can't believe this yeah. is staged. That's a lot for staging. That's a lot for staging. Probably owned by the people who, who are living there now. Okay. So I don't think that's I don't think that's a candidate to find a um, a rehabber. Uh, um, what about 613? Are, are, are you 613 drum? Yeah, that's, six, that's okay. the property. Okay, so that's the subject property. So here's one that's active under contract, right? That's another one looks like somebody did a little TLC on it, right? It's kind of an interesting rehab because they kept the arches. Uh -huh. But it does look like it's relatively new. That, that's a new floor. That's a new floor. Okay, so again, 
Let's now go look and see who owns 809 Glacier. So I go to SDAT, right? I select Prince George's County. By the way, are we now seeing why we may want to hire a virtual assistant? Yeah. <laughs> like who wants to, like you do this a couple of times and you're like, okay, I get it, Sherman. I don't <laughs> want to do this anymore. I want to pay somebody to do this. Right. Literally going through and seeing what's available, 809 Glacier, G-L-A-C-I-E-R? G-L-A-C-I-E-R, right? Do right. search. Okay, Light Touch LLC. That sounds like a rehabber to me. Right. Purchased a property um, from Fur Plumbing and Heating. Now, is Fur Humming and Fur Plumbing and Heating really in the rehabbing space? That's kind of weird to see Fur Heating Plumbing. Mm -hmm. I wonder if this person, Fabriquito Cornado, hired Fur and didn't pay Fur, and Fur basically put a lien on the property and snatched it from him. Ah, so is that why it says zero dollars? Yeah, on top of which, notice the time that they owned it. So they closed on March the 4th and then resold it on July the 1st. Hmm. So I suspect that this Fabricante Canarado probably did not pay their bill and Fur Plumbing and Heating probably filed the lien, perfected the lien and took the property and then turned around and resold it three months later, four months later, really, for 132000 And now this Light Touch LLC, who currently owns it, mm -hmm. looks like they rehabbed it. Now they got it on the market for 300 and some thousand. So let's see if we can find Light Touch LLC. So again, same thing, go to SDAT, but instead of going to the, to the real estate side, we go to the business side, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, S that business, business entity search, copy and paste the name of the LLC that owns the property, up pops light touch and they're active. They were formed in 2019, they are domestic, they're in good standing, hit the filing history, mm -hmm. there's the articles of organization and boom. This one is this one was actually done at um, what you'll call it. And look, they did what they weren't supposed to do. They put in their name and their address and the person who owns it is named Ebony Jones. Yeah. Can we call Ebony Jones and say, hey, look, Miss Ebony, we know that you are active as a rehabber because we see one of your listings. Are you interested in more properties? Aren't you glad that not everybody listens to Sherman? <laughs> Can you, you guys can't see that. I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Pop, when the pop-up popped up, let me show you, let me show you what we're looking at. You're looking at the article? That's the pop-up. It's the right. actual articles of organization. Uh -huh. How do I know that this one was done at Preston Street? Because this one doesn't look like it was computer generated. This one looks like somebody actually hand filled it in. And we have Light Touch LLC, which owns the property, real estate buying and selling. The address of the limited liability company is 1506 Village Green Drive. Does that sound like a residential address or an office address? Yeah. House, ad home address. It's Ebony Jones used her home address. Yeah. Hey, let's try this. 1506 Village Green. Let's try this. Stop sharing screen. Start sharing screen. What happens if we type in 1506 Village Green? What was it, Hyattsville? Hyattsville. H I at Bill. Maryland. Oh, look, there's the address. Let's click on the address. You know what? That actually might be a business address. Or it might be townhouses. You see what I'm seeing? Yeah, probably townhouses. So if I click like on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like townhouses. And I can actually get drive-by drive directions to Ebony's house from the office. Okay. <laughs> See how that works? That's why you don't want to do that. Everything you give to the state becomes public record. 
everything. Okay. So, any of it, are you now seeing how to use the MLS to mine yeah. for buyers? Got it. Yeah. So, even though you're not using all of these listings for comps, there's other things you can use those listings for. Right. Does that help? It does. Thanks so much. And, and again, even though you guys are seeing this on my desktop through Bright MLS, you have the same power in your hands with your virtual app, your mobile app. Okay. Sherman? Yes. Yeah, hi, this is John. I have a follow-up question to what you've just been discussing with uh, Aya. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I'm completely new at this, and but just following your uh, uh, MAO formula, so the subject property that I was looking at, I think it was uh, the asking price was uh, 283000 or something like that. Um, they're asking, they're asking, they're asking. Subject property was 613 drum. They're asking 283. Right. No way in the world it's worth 283. Right. So if I pull the comps, I got 265, 255, 275. Right. The and Mayo formula would be 255 times 0.75 minus 50. Okay. So, oops. So you get something like uh, 130,000 or something like that, I think. Sounds about right. All right. 130,000. Yep. Or somewhere around that. Right. And, and by the way, everybody else who's offering on that property is offering about the same thing because they're all basically using the mail formula. Okay. So, and, and you know, it was one By the way, by the way let, let, me, let me point out one thing, which I didn't point out when I was there. This house has already been on the market 104 days. This okay. house has already been on the market 104 days. When it first came out, they listed it at 290. Way overpriced. Okay. Got it. So, so actually, they know they know that they are asking to because everything else is selling in the neighborhood in 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 you know in like 45 to 60 days. They're already on the market going on their fourth month. Okay. And everything else around them is selling in a month or two. They know they're overpriced. They okay. know that. So the but using the MAO formula at 0.75 actually gets me 141,250. So it's 100, it's over 140,000, 141,000. Yeah. So it was one thing to kind of um, learn from you during the 21 day class and you go over the formula and you get a number. Now this, this example was awesome. And it was as if, you know, you're really trying to, you're about to put out, put out an offer. Yep. And when I look at a house that was asking you 283 and I, I understand it's been on the market for hundred days. And the MAO formula gives me 141,000. As a newbie, at this point, I'd be like, uh, is this really going to work? <laughs> is, you know, and this would be the point where I'd be getting, uh, uh, you know, getting, having some doubts. If I do this 25 times, am I going to get one back? You know, you know how to get over your doubts? Uh, uh, I don't know. No, I don't know. I don't just do it. I, do what Sherman said to do. Just do what Sherman says to do. Okay. First of all, you're not going to spend as much time formulating an offer for a particular property as we just spent. In in the example, as you point out, in the example I gave, I I showed her four or five different things. Right? If I'm just if I'm just going after writing up my offers, I'm just going to pull those three comps. Right, the 265, 255. I'm gonna take a quick look, say, do they look relatively similar? Okay, great. What's the low? What's the high? The low is 255, the high is 285. The 250, sorry, 255, 265, 275. The high is 275. Well, they're already listed higher than the highest high. And that house doesn't look anything like the house that was rehabbed. Mm -hmm. So while you're look, let me tell you, while you're busy second guessing yourself about is this gonna work, three or four other people in the class have already gotten their offers out the street. Mm -hmm. And they may well, they very well, they might very well get rejected. But one thing I can absolutely guarantee you looking at the listing on the property, it's been on the market for 104 days in a neighborhood where their average days on market is about 30. Sooner or later, they're going to wake up and smell the coffee and realize their house is way overpriced. Typically that happens when the seller says, agent, you haven't done your job because you didn't bring me any offers, any viable offers, right? I'm going to fire you and go hire another agent. 
And that new agent is going to tell them the same thing. And now all of a sudden the house has gone from days on market 104 to days on market 265 to days on market 365. And sooner or later they wake up and go, I need to drop my price. So who gets the house? The, pet, the person who's second guessing themselves and doesn't put any offers in the street or the person who has their offer making on autopilot and that's the day they decide to drop the price to something more reasonable and that's the day they get your offer. Gotcha. Let's, let's look at it one more time to, just so I can reinforce this, okay? This is the house, got it? Can you see, the, can you see my screen okay? Yes. This house looks like this. Got it? Yeah, yeah. This house has been on the market for 104 days. Yeah. When it first came out, it was listed for $290,000. This house is 1,100 square feet. Three bedroom, two bath, 1,100 square feet built in 1960. Got it? Mm -hmm. Now, let's go look at other houses that are also $290,000, right? That are comparable size. Here's a house that's 299, that's five bedroom, two bath. Now it's not closed, it's pending. So I would not use it to formulate my comps, but it's worth taking a look at, wouldn't you agree? Mm -hmm. Two tenths of a mile away. Let's look at that house. This is what this, whoops, sorry. My mouse is moving faster than it should be. Can you see that house? Yeah. Let's look at this house. Little junky, but is this house different than the other house? Much nicer, much nicer. And it's not even the best one. But it's, you know, but the appliances are better, even, even with the dent, right? Even with the dent in the fridge, right? The wash and dryer are newer. The walls are blown out. The bathroom is nicer. Everything, I mean, it's a little junky, but everything about that house is nicer. It's the same square footage. It's roughly about the same age. I mean, that one said it was 1960s, it was 1940, but it's basically the same house, okay? Now, let's look at another one. That was 299. Let's look at a two. All right, here's a 275. This one is closed. Now we've seen it. 1,200 square feet. This one actually sold at 275. Is this house nicer? Yes, yes. By far. So what in, the, what in the person's right mind leads them to believe that they can get 280 when this house that sold for 275 back in November is dramatically nicer than the house they have? No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Just, I just can't, my initial feeling is, gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm low, I, I agree it's, the house is, uh, the subject house is way overpriced. Uh, but, at 140,000 bid, I mean, you know, how do you yeah, But, but guess what? 140 is the right number because whoever buys that house is going to have to put some amount of work into that house. Okay. okay. And I guarantee you this every offer they're seeing right now is about in that same range. Really? Wow. Sure. Who, who's going to buy that house at 280? Uh, no, nobody. But some, I mean, um, I guess if somebody put in a 250 bid, it might have sold already. Who's going to put in a bid for 250? Yeah. Yeah. Who? All right. Nobody. Right now, that house is probably dead in the water. It's so overpriced that anybody who's anybody who's a first-time home buyer or a home owner who's looking to move in the neighborhood, they're having their real estate agents pull comps for houses that are currently out there in the market. All right. So they're seeing that amongst the active ones. They're seeing 339, 235, right? 283. No, this is 283. Sorry. That, that is all right. And they're going, 
this person wants $283,000 for this house? My God, I pulled a contractor off of, um, what's, what's, that, what's that list? What's, what's the one that's, that provides you with home improvement contractors? Angie's list. Angie's list. I pulled somebody from the Angie's list and they said it's going to be $150,000 to fix this house up. That's why that house has been sitting on the market for 104 days. Okay. All right. And will probably sit on the market for another 104 days until they drop the price to something reasonable. Or, you know what? Let the house sit on the market for two years and ultimately they might get 283 when everything else in the neighborhood's selling for 350. Now when you do the mail formula for 350, 283 sounds okay. Maybe. Right, right. Okay. Here's my point. Don't second guess yourself. Just get the offers out the door. Okay. All right. You, you're, you're having a negotiation with yourself. Yeah. And yeah. choosing not to submit an offer. Yeah. <laughs> the seller, on the other hand, is seeing all these quote unquote lowball offers that also have all these contingencies in them, going, Will somebody bring me a decent offer? And then finally, yours hits the desk, and maybe it's 10,000, 20,000 less, but you don't have a bunch of junky stuff in the offer. And like, Well, do you think they'll come up a little higher? Yeah. Don't second guess yourself. Just do what okay. Sherman says to do. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. But a good, but great question. Great questions. I also had great questions. All right, does everybody see, anybody else have any questions for me before we get out of here? Because it is like, this is supposed to be open office hours and we've already gone, see, you see how the time just flies when we're hanging out together? Isn't that great? Sherman, can I just ask one closeout question to that? Absolutely, yes ma'am. Please. So when I did the mail formula, I got 162, 250 for that property okay. um, as my MAO. I know that's the maximum allowable. So. If I wanted to submit an offer, what would you think would be a, a good price? The one you just came up with? The 162? So I, always I, admit, I always start with Mayo. Oh, start with Mayo. Okay. Start with Mayo. Because Mayo's, Mayo's already low enough. You don't need to go below it. Below that. Okay. I always submit Mayo. Okay. Okay. And again, remember what I said in the prior, prior days. Once you get out there, once you get the highest and best, you get out there with the contractor. If you feel like you can offer more, offer more. Once you find a buyer, like if you do some of the things I suggested to you, I like actually, as you're going through this, spend a little extra time and yeah. identify those properties that are on the market now and hunt down who those owners are. Yeah. Reach out to them, put them on your buyer's list. Mm -hmm. If they're interested in more properties in Capitol Heights. Will do. Okay. Thank you. You're very, very welcome. Um, did she use the highest or the lowest? When you do your Mayo, you always, you, you always buy on the low, sell on the high. Okay. When, when you do, again, the Mayo formula is the offer you make for the first initial offer. If you get better information from your contractor, if you get better information by identifying one or two buyers, um, then offer more money if you, can still make, if you can still make a deal and make money. You reach out to one of those people that has a property listed for 340 and they're like, yeah, I just got under contract. I'm looking for another house to rehab because I like Capitol Heights right now. Great, you're in the hunt. What do you want to pay? What do you got? I'm, I'm working on a deal right now that's about 11, 1200 square feet. 11, 1200 square feet, you know, 11, 1200, you know, what's it need? Pretty much everything. Okay, yeah. Mm, I'll give you 200. Okay, offer 180. I'll give you 220. Offer 200. You see what I'm saying? The more variables you have to work with, the more you can sharpen your pencil and do what you need to do. So I would tell them pretty much everything, but not 50K. Leave that up to their contractor to determine. Yeah, yeah, they'll, they'll tell you what they're going to put into right, it. Again, right. if you look at some of those rehabs that we saw, those uh -huh. are $100,000 rehabs. Right. Yeah. Okay. All right, any other questions? Because it's getting kind of late, guys. <laughs> but I'll stick around for a little bit. All right, so those of you who are signed up and signed buyer broker agreements, I'll be meeting with you guys on Wednesday at 5. Those of you who signed up for the apprentice program, I'll be meeting with you shortly, um, possibly even Wednesday. Um, and those of you who signed up for membership, um, we'll also be circling back and having a conversation with you. And you are of course all invited. If you're a member, if you're going through the apprentice program or you signed up by a broker agreement, you are all invited to attend next Tuesday's deal maker workshop and open office hours. And anything I didn't cover today, I'll be happy to cover as a part of open office hours that we will go back to doing again for our members starting on Wednesdays at five o'clock. And then this week's coming up masterclass, um, I think is gonna be on list building because that seems to be a topic. And maybe we'll even pick up uh, from the conversation we had with Aya, 
of actually looking at properties that are being listed and actually how do you reach out to folks and formulate some templates and checklists and cheat sheets to work to reach out to people to see if they can get on the buyers list. Okay. All right, guys. Uh, one more thing I want to show you, and then we're gonna get out of here. This was an abandoned house. This was a neighborhood that had older houses in it that I, I don't live that far away. So I used to come through here just looking for opportunities and came through here one time uh, about a year and a half ago. And um, this house was abandoned. Matter of fact, I had to stop and get out and go up to the front just to get the, the uh, house number because it was just overgrown. We essentially bought the house for $65,000. Um, we paid another, I think it was about 20 some odd thousand to get it off the auction block. The, we paid about, uh, the rehab cost was not about, about 180, something like that. I don't have the exact numbers. And then <clears throat> we sold it for 505 was a sales price. The amount that she and I made on this was uh, a little bit over 308,000. Well, uh, I had a lot of help at various times from real investors. Uh, at first, I had talked to Jesse a little bit about it, and he originally suggested in contacting the owner to send, you know, a registered letter. Now, the owner never responded to a registered letter, but he did res respond hey, to a, um, a, just a, a letter from regular mail. I was listening to one of Sherman's Thursday night uh, sessions after we thought that we had lost the house based on going to auction. But it was just interesting that that night, Sherman mentioned the fact that you could go pay the taxes and bring the house off the auction. So at the next day, which was Friday, I called my partner Zena and I told her what I had heard. And so we went and we paid the back taxes and got the house off the auction. So, um, <clears throat> and then, you know, part of the time we were dealing, dealing, I was dealing with this, we were in the apprentice program. So we had, you know, little piece of advice here and there from various folks um, at Real Investors about you know, certain ways to proceed. Well, the 21 day course, uh, for me anyway, gave me some basics because I really didn't know anything about real estate and real estate investing. And it's sort of like, you know, going through and learning just the basics of how this works, what to look for, certain questions to ask, certain information that you needed to know, you know. Well, the benefits, uh, especially in this situation, is the amount of money that you can make, okay? Um, we probably could have done this and wholesale it, but um, what we learned doing it, going through all of the issues and the problems and solving those problems was invaluable. We, we learned an awful lot doing this. And wholesaling is what I hear is, you know, the average is ten, fifteen thousand dollars Although I've seen some people at, uh, I think it was a, someone that made uh, doing a deal in uh, D.C., $150,000 a wholesale fee. Um, I, at the time, you know, we didn't even think about wholesaling. The only thing that caught in our mind was we're going to rehab this house and so. Well, for us, it was, uh, I don't know. 10 times as much. Yeah. <clears throat> like I said, we divided uh, over $308,000 on this one property. Just from my knowledge of doing this and listening to other people, um, each situation is so different. There's so many different things that you have to consider in rehabbing. Um, but just as you know, uh, it says on the wall, the real investors, you learn it by doing it. You're not going to learn it by uh, in the book because everything changes from, from uh, rehab to rehab so much. 
I mean, there's, you know, those are the basics. You know, a lot of times here what you find is, you know, um, you really need the basics, and then you use those basics to go out and do, you know, what you feel is necessary. You know, they give you some background, and it, it also gives you a place to go back and ask some questions. My name is Robert Cook, myself and my partner, Zena, paid over $308,000 on this deal. We're real investors, and we get real checks. All right, guys, on a scale of one to five, do me a favor, head on over to Trustpilot <laughs> and give me a rating, uh, Trustpilot, on how you have enjoyed uh, the past 21 day experience. And I am going to shoot you guys a, a brief survey and also a couple more documents that you guys asked me for um, just to figure out you know, ways that we can improve. But just go ahead and rate it. Uh, on the Trust Pilot website, and I greatly appreciate you guys giving me the chance to, you know, be your mentor, be your coach for 21 days. And I hope that you found this valuable. And uh, those of you guys who are in the apprentice program, those of you guys who are members, and those of you guys who send your buyer broker agreements, um, you are very much part of the family. And we'll see you on Tuesday for the Deal Maker Workshop, Wednesday for office hours, and Thursday for our first uh, mini class, master class of the year. Thanks, guys. See you soon. Bye. Don't forget to go to Trustpilot.